Broadcasting live from Global Headquarters and RP Enterprises in Greenwood, Missouri. Stand by on this frequency. After 22 years of entertaining FM radio listeners across the U.S., across the U.S., this man is the owner and executive producer of the award-winning Heartland Waterfowl on Sportsman's Channel, CEO and founder of Dumar Chemical Solutions, and the man behind the mic of Papa Ron Radio Voiceovers and Production. He's the man, the myth, the legend, a global icon, future Nobel Prize winner, and of course he paid me to say all this. Really? Literally. Welcome to the Papa Ron Podcast. Here's your host, Ronnie Phillips. Ronnie Phillips. Well, Jillian, we're officially legal. We're officially legal. 21, episode 21 of the Papa Ron podcast. I'm Ronnie Phillips along with Jillian Gregg and excited about uh, today's podcast. Although I'm not sure who decided to schedule this particular podcast immediately after the Chiefs would have lost a really big game to the Buffalo uh. Bills. I think we were anticipating maybe a victory, which would make it maybe a little bit more exciting going into this yeah, particular show. That was the goal. That yeah. was the goal. I thought, okay, this is going to be awesome. We're going to beat the Bills, and then we get to talk to Louie. And um, and I was a little bit confused. I'm, I'm probably going to ask some dumb football questions, because even <laughs> at my age yesterday, I was like trying to figure out the whole difference in the punter and a kicker. But oh. I even when I texted you, Ronnie, last week, I said, oh, you know, Butker's back. So this would be a perfect fit. But it's not the same, right? Like, Butker's uh, a kicker he yes. is a kicker yes yes but our guest today is a punter is a punter but i also yeah. kicked you did oh, also okay, okay. okay. Well, hold on hold on. Sorry, ladies and sorry, gentlemen sorry. welcome to episode 21 <laughs> of the papa ron podcast uh, mr former kansas city chiefs punter louis aguiar Yay. Whoa. Whoa. number five that's thank right you for having me number one in your heart yes that's right keep telling everybody um <laughs> thank you for coming out to uh rp global rp enterprises global headquarters <laughs> This is wonderful. In, this in Greenwood, Missouri. Isn't it nice? Amazing. Thank I you. I appreciate you being here. I, you know what? I'm, I got to say this, um, and I hope that I've conducted myself in a way where you feel welcomed and you're comfortable. And, and I'm so comfortable. I'm relaxed. Good. But I got coffee. Yes, yeah. Dirty Duck Coffee right there. Dirty High Velocity coffee. Dirty Duck Good Coffee. Stuff. Good yeah, stuff. I, need the, I, need the, I need the caffeine getting up at 7. You, well, you've got morning. it with the High Velocity. But what I was about to say is I'm a little bit geeking out. I'm a little geeking out. And I know that you've known Louie for years from yeah. going back to the days when you worked with Randy Miller. And yep. I remember being part-time at Q104 uh, and listening to the radio station when you guys would be having Louie yeah. on the air frequently. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, I remember. I a hardcore Chiefs fan growing up, right? You know? Right. And Louie, you were like the best in the league, or at least one of the best in the league. You were doing very, very well. You were you were recognized yeah. as one of the best punters in the league when you were playing with the Chiefs. I worked hard at it. Yeah, you know, it was just it was a craft that I was given, mm -hmm. and I used it to the, my best ability that I could. Yeah, you did. And I did, and of course during that time, you know that was those were Marty years where the the team is Man. really starting to propel because prior before Marty got here, you know the Chiefs were awful. Yeah. I mean, they were terrible, you know, yeah. and then it was a, get, you get a few, get a few thousand people in the stands. Yes. It right. was awful. Well, and you get like a, what was it? Number 19. What was his name? Joe Montana. Oh yeah. Joe yeah. Montana. Yeah. You get yes. somebody like that. You get Derek Thomas. So mm -hmm. man, mm -hmm. Marcus, Allen. Aguiar, yeah. Yeah. Marcus Allen, Marcus yeah, Allen, another big one. Uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, <sighs> as much as I'm trying to keep it all together here as a 47 year old man, deep down inside, there's a kid in me that is just geeking out that Louis freaking Aguiar is in my house <laughs> and in my office and on our podcast. So I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to be here. I really uh -huh. am. I miss doing things. Uh, I love doing as much as I can, uh, talking, um, like I was telling you earlier, you know, mm -hmm. we're upstairs, you know, you know, I love doing the radio mm -hmm. stuff cause I have the facial radio cause I don't want to be seen on TV that much. <laughs> yeah, but you're on camera today. Yeah, so I know, wave now I'm the on camera. camera. I'm like, Wee, yeah, cool. <laughs> How did that all come together when you were in Kansas city and that you got connected with Randy Miller and was doing so much, uh, stuff with them on the radio? I got asked by, um, uh, I was out one night and I think it was, uh, Kimberly Ray goes, hey, mm. yep. we do a radio show. Would you like to come on? I'm all yeah. sure. 
<laughs> why not? So why not? And they go with Randy Miller. I said, oh, I'd love to. And so I came <laughs> on and we hit it off the first show. And at the end of the show, uh, Randy goes, you want to come back next week? And I'm all sure. Mm -hmm. So I came back next week. And so we started. Then after that, I came on did the rest you, of the season. Did you always come in studio to do that? Yeah, or I always did you came in studios yeah. uh, on Tuesdays after, you know, we did at 7 o'clock in the morning. Wow. So, yeah, every Tuesday, because the first year I remember listening to him, my first year here in 94, I remember listening to him on the radio every morning. I listened to uh, Randy, and then I got <laughs> asked to do it. I'm like, heck, yeah. Right. So, 95, it started, and so I did it the next four years. I, I had a blast. It was a little bit, and, and this is going to sound terrible, and so please don't take it the, uh, the way it's going to sound, but <clears throat> typically when you're a kid, right? So, I'm at the time that he's playing ball, I'm a teenager, mm -hmm. and- you're watching, you only know what you know based on watching the actual broadcast sure. of the game, right? Sure. And so you see all of these dynamic personalities, Joe Montana, yeah. Marcus Allen, yeah. Dan Sa yeah. Salamuya, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Neil Smith, Derek yeah. Thomas, they're yeah. on the sideline. They're always yeah. getting all this TV time, right? Yeah. right? And then you see them, they're screaming at each other or they're jacked up and they're all these facial expressions. <laughs> well, then you get Louis Aguiar who's coming onto the field. Yeah. And so he comes on and he's very he's in the zone. He's getting ready to punt. And then he goes back off to the field and, and you know, he's on the sideline and he's just kind of to himself. Yeah. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, the perception is Louis kind of a to his guy just quiet punter. <laughs> and then you listen to him too on the Randy Miller, Randy Miller morning show. He's like, well, this guy's got a lot of personality. Yeah. <laughs> Cause you know, cause on game day, it's just me and the kicker. Yeah. You know, no one else talks to us unless we have a bad punt. Or right. miss field goal. Then what yells at you? Oh, what the hell? You only have one thing to do. No, no. All you do is kick a ball all day. No, no, no. Yeah, I know that. So on game day, it's just like it's you. You're seen and not heard from. Mm. Yeah. So I knew my place. Mm -hmm. You know, I learned that from Pat Leahy, my rookie year with the Jets. It was his 18th season. It was my first year in the league in New York. And uh, I said, you know, what do we do? He goes, oh, we just sit here, watch the game. We warm up. We kick in the net. We go out and kick our kick the ball and come over here and sit down and just be seen and not heard. I'm all, okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because he was 41 at the time. Pat was. Oh, wow. And I was okay. 20, 23, 24. And I'm all, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. You know, so I just learned just to go out do my job, be yeah. seen and not heard. Because yeah. if the I figured out if the fans knew your name as a punter, you're not doing your job. Mm. So I want to be seen oh. and not heard from. So I just, that's an interesting way to, you know, you put it. the ball well, the yay, when you shank it, then they start yelling, hey, are you suck. And that's when you know they know your name. <laughs> I would think that would be worse with the kicker than it would be with the punter. Yeah, I mean, it is. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You know, you know, I still remember we were talking about 95 season and, mm -hmm. um, Yeah. <laughs> That was a that was a tough that was a that was a tough loss. Yeah, I yeah. remember his name, Ellie. Is that what you're talking yeah, about? Ellen Elliot. Yeah. 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 I just I we were really good friends and I just had a hard you know, it was just <clears throat> Yeah. Man, okay, so I got so many things there. Let's go let's come back to Lynn Elliott. Yeah. We got we got plenty of time. So let's There's come back so to Lynn much. Elliott. There's so much so to unpack much. here. But I, I bas I guess what I was basically saying is is that it was cool for me to see that perception isn't always reality Correct. and that when you're listening to the Randy Moore Miller morning show mm -hmm. back then, and you heard um, our guest on the air, Louis Aguiar, that it was, you know, completely different than what you were seeing on Correct. TV. Right. So yeah, I, was, I enjoyed that because I, you know, like I said, everybody saw me, I was on TV. I was quiet. I didn't do much. You know, if I had a good punt, I'd go down and high five and, you know, crank. after every punt, no matter what, good, bad, or ugly, I'd always go down and thank my guys for covering for me yeah. because those guys, that's, they helped me out so much. Yeah. So after, you know, if you watch, if you go back and watch old videos, you always see me going down and thanking everybody and congratulating for doing whatever I, cause I just wanted to be a part of the team. And so I was, that's about the only time I ever talked. And then I was quiet, did my job. Then being with Randy, you know, I got to enjoy myself and have fun. Yeah. You know, and just, we talked about anything and everything and made jokes and just, yeah, I just That's had cool. a great time. Cool. And, you know, we still remember the purse lady where she, you know. <laughs> Who doesn't? <Right>. Really? <laughs> oh, my God. You know, and I'm yelling, open it up. Open it up. <laughs> and she calls, you know, then she calls the Chiefs and tries to get me in trouble. And Oh, I did not know that. Yeah. She called the Chiefs and said that, you know, Louie's over there time, telling Randy to open up my purse. And no, no. So, yeah, they, the GM came to me and they talked to me about it. I'm Carl all, hey. Peterson came to you about yeah. this? And I'm all, <laughs> Oh, hey. my gosh. I go, I, I go, I'm just in the studio. 
I can't control what a 40-year-old man's doing. I can only encourage him. <laughs> <laughs> so I go, hey, he got the purse on while we're on a weekend. I just want to see what's in the purse. Mm -hmm. You that know, so yeah. So I was just encouraging him and open it up. Let's see what she got. You know, we're having a good old time. Yeah. And then she called and got me in trouble, tried to get me in trouble. And I'm all, hey. I'm just a guest there. I, right. Yeah. Right. So those who might be listening and have no idea what we're talking about, Randy Miller is obviously a morning show or was a morning show personality at Q104 in Kansas City way back in the day. Jillian was a co-host with him, as you may have experienced in the, in the interview that we did with her mm -hmm. uh, a few episodes ago. Louie was a regular guest on the Randy Miller morning show, yep. and there was a... Uh, an episode, and Joe, you can probably tell the story better than I can, but my recollection is is that they were at the grocery store. Uh, this woman leaves her purse on the car. She's driving off. Randy's trying right. to chase her down. Right. She's not very pleasant about it. Right. She was rude. Yeah. She left it on the roof or the trunk or something of the car. He picks it up and he's trying to chase, you know, trying to get her attention. And he, she thinks he's, I don't know what, she's yeah. not paying attention. She's yelling, screaming at him. And so he's like, okay, fine. So I'll take the person. Yeah. And I mean, this went on for, I don't even know how long this Months. was. That was, was, that was it actually it was, bef yeah. before my, my time on, yeah, on the morning before, show. Just right. before your time there. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, it went on forever and he took the purse and went on the air. She called, I don't know how many times he ended up putting it on a billboard. Well, no, he did it. Somebody else did. Somebody else did. <laughs> See, that's what, yeah, Allegedly. Yeah. Yeah, allegedly. Okay. <laughs> allegedly it got stolen from him and put up on a the billboard. The purse ended up on a billboard. Yeah. And, and I don't yeah. think Dangerous Dave had anything to do with it. Mm. Oh, right. Bless his soul who's yeah. passed right. away. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah, he was, yeah, I, I yeah, I wonder if, I, I still don't know if he took it and put it, stole it and took it, put it up, but yeah, but somebody put yeah. it up there. I have no idea. Yeah. But it was on I-35, and I still remember that, driving by, and it was just bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic, because I had to go by and see it. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. And speaking of, you know, some would call that like this, like a radio, it turned into this huge, like, thing, not, yeah. was not like a bit or whatever, but um, we I posted on Facebook that I was we were going to talk to you, and yeah. so people, you know, want to ask questions and things. So later, we want to talk about the the fake the fake punt pass oh yeah up in Seattle. So we'll, yeah well yeah we'll, we'll hey, get I got to that, that so. i even have that on my phone i can show it to you guys a video yeah, yeah. i got a video of me throwing it yeah I think oh I've definitely seen it. send that to me and then we'll try to embed that in, okay. into the actual video <laughs> portion of this podcast. i don't want to make you do too much you know i don't have to make you edit too much and julian said it's she doesn't mind, but she, it's just a pain in the rear end for you. I'll, I'll offer that we can edit things, but I'm not right, the one editing. Right. So I'm really it's good at that. It's not the three hours out of her day to do right. edit. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Luckily, exactly. I get the final say as the executive producer of this show. <laughs> uh, or pro executive producer, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, your list is like about this long. Yeah, <laughs> kind of. That's right. Yeah, well, that's right. not that long, but yeah, well, a little bit the longer. The intro sounded like this long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's what it was intended to yeah. do. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Louis Aguiar, our guest uh, on the Papa Ron podcast, episode 21. So cool to have you here. So I was going to ask you about um, Lynn Elliott and, and Nick Lowry. Because obviously you worked very closely with those two individuals, but you not only were a punter, you were also the long snap holder, right? Yeah, like I, you were the, I, yes, you, you, I held for field goals. Mm -hmm. I kicked off. I punted. Uh, I kicked field goals when Ellen Elliott got injured during training camp. I kicked when Stanovich got injured. I kicked for him. Oh, yeah. So I could do all. I Pat Leahy got injured. I kicked for him. So I, I was one of the few guys that actually could punt kick off and mm -hmm. kick field goals. But then when I when I was kicking field goals, I couldn't hold for myself. <laughs> so I had to, you know, ninety four, right. you know, we're all you know Warren Moon can't come in and, and well, catch Warren, us. Warren wasn't with us the time in oh, ninety four. Well whoever who was the backup quarterback then? Uh well actually back in the day the backup quarterback would always hold the My holder when I was in ninety four when Lynn got injured was the legend. Joe Montana. He actually did the holding. What? Yes. No he way. Held, he held for Ray Warshing in San Francisco. Huh. Because when he was a backup to Steve DeBerg, wow. he was, oh, he was a backup. Yeah. When he was a holder for behind DeBerg. And then when he would came the starter, he still held for Ray Warshing. So I grew up watching San Francisco. Cause I grew up 45 minutes mm -hmm. east of San Francisco. Everybody goes, you sure are not West. I'm off. I'm West. I'm in the ocean. You're right. So yeah. I know it's east. I know yeah, it's when, east. When, you know, never eats our week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was, I was, I was, I was east. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I was. Yeah, okay. I was so, east. so is it? This is here's 
Here comes a dumb football question. No, no, it's no, no questions are dumb. Just no. like when you know when I'm in class and they always say you know no questions are dumb. I right. I don't. No. I was one of those dumb kids. There, no, there are dumb questions. <laughs> no, leave it to me. Oh, not so when you're beautiful like you. So oh we're good. Gosh, okay, oh, I paid him to say that. Yep. Um. So so it's uncommon for someone to do all three. Yes. Why? Why is it's, one harder than another? I don't want to get injured. It's uh, different. Oh. Different leg, different leg muscles are used. Okay. Oh, you're talking about the kicker. I thought yeah. you were talking about the holder. Sorry. No, the kicker. Oh yeah, no kick, kicking, kicking punting. Because when you're punting, my leg comes straight through. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when I'm punting, a place kicking, my leg's coming across. So it's two different motions. Okay, but and same most leg. Most kickers are soccer players. Oh. Because it's a soccer motion. Yeah. And the punting motion is something different uh you know so it's you know it's a lot of soccer players are not punters because they have that leg swing that comes across okay and they shank the balls but so in punting you got to have your leg come straight through the ball okay so it's two different two different leg swings so most kickers are were soccer players at one time and do you just use the same leg yes you like does anybody use no I, I was going to say something, but I I want to I'm I'm going to well, try to keep it classy. I was going to ask another dumb question, but I know it would go dirty. So will you promise well, not you to know, go dirty? You know, right leg, left leg, and no, 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 no. Will you promise not to go dirty and just let people's mind go there? If I yeah, ask right. you another question, I, said. I have a right leg and a left leg. Yeah. So you kicked with your right leg, and I also have a uh, no. You kicked with your right. Knee. I have a left knee and a right knee, and I know left knee and a right knee. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. And I have an Oscar Mayer. Uh -huh. I, I know, I know. A beanie weenie. So yeah. was your, when you were when you were kicking, was you your? Use, I always use my right leg. Was your right leg bigger than your left leg? Don't go, just answer the question. Well, no, it diff, it's different. My left calf was bigger than my right calf because when I planted. Oh. So when I plant, oh. my left calf okay. is actually bigger. Okay. And my right quad it was a little bigger than my left quad. Okay. So I understand, yes, because my right, my left, my because when I plant, I plant here, so yeah. my muscle goes this way. Okay. But now when I punt, see now if you look at my cast, when I yeah. plant here, see how this one turns? Yeah. Now when I go straight, this one goes this way, so it's huh. there. Huh. Actually, when you stand behind me, Malai, people always go, "I always thought your right calf would be bigger." I'm all, "No, it's my left calf," because that's when that's I the plant. power comes from yeah. your thigh. Yeah, the punt huh. that comes from my left well, leg. My left calf has a shock absorber, kind of like shock absorber in a car. Right. When I push off the punt, I kind of like a shock absorber. I go from here to here, uh -huh. so I'm using my left calf to push up through the So ball. the actual power is coming from the plant leg? Correct. Oh, I would have just thought it was yeah. different. I thought no. it would be the actual... That's why I always came off, the, when I punt, I'd come off the ground. Makes sense. So yeah. can we time out here for just... That was not a dumb question. No. no it was a very good question. It was actually a really oh good question. Gosh. That was a great question. So that's why I was, you know. Hey, let me just defer to Jillian for the rest right. of this interview. All the football well, questions. Yeah. She was saying, what leg do you use? I'm like, well, I, I'm right no, nah, bah, 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 bah. So I was trying to figure out what she actually meant. Yeah, no, you knew what I meant. You knew what I meant. Well, what leg, yeah, I'm right okay. foot, so I, I punted and place kicked and kicked off with my right leg. My okay. left leg was my punt. Not foot. ambidextrous. You went to college at Utah State, right? Yes, sir. And so were you punting and kicking yes. there? You did no. both. Yes. I, so I, it wasn't I, really frowned upon back in college to do both. No, I did it in high school. I was a, I was a starting quarterback my senior year. Yeah, but in high school, school you're playing every position, yeah, you know. Right. So like, mm -hmm. but I'm talking about as you eventually tr uh, progress into the pros, right? You know, was I had there, to choose. What was the was the that was the fear though was because of the different leg motions. Yeah, yeah I, I mean. I grew up playing soccer, so it was no big deal to me. I just, okay, we need to play. So why is it a big game. deal to the people in the pros? That's what I'm trying to it's understand. Because I mean, I understand your answer. Right. The leg motion, but what are a, they? It's two different leg motions, leg that. swings. And, you know, a lot of people go, well, why can't we just use one? Why can't we just have one guy that does both? Well, if he gets injured, what do you do? Well, you, hopefully you have a safety who you, can kick. Like, Yeah, <laughs> but you, you might have a safety who can kick. He yeah. does, Rude does a great job. But now who you, you got to find somebody to punt. Yeah. Then mm -hmm. you got to find, you know, then you have yeah. to find somebody to, you know, the holder's going to be, because if you have a guy who can do punt and kick, yeah. you know, you got, like we're talking, you're, you're backup quarterback, they hold, but then if you get hurt, somebody gets hurt, mm -hmm. you know, then you're, you're out two things. Cause I remember playing against Denver, Jason Elam, the kicker pulled his groin in warm up. Yeah. And so, and then Tommy Ruin had to kick off. On his first kick off the game, he pulled his groin. So they were both oh down. Oh my gosh. I actually remember that. <laughs> Yeah. That was oh years gosh. ago. Yeah. yeah. And they both, and then, because Tommy was a punter. He didn't play soccer. And he tried to kick off, and he was off. Oh, God. He, he was off. <laughs> I could have kicked farther left foot than he could right footed. Because oh. my longest field goal left footed was 45 yards, but my longest in practice with my right leg was 70. So you're ambidextrous? Oh, wow. 
Well, I played soccer. Yeah, I was. Yeah, but, okay. you know, I could kick 45 yards field goal with my left leg, but a 70 yard field goal with my right leg was my longest. Wow. But I always punted. Everybody knew me, you know, when I was junior college, I did both. But when I went to Utah State, they said, we well, need a punter. So I went from punting, kicking, and kicking off to punting and kicking off. Hmm. Okay. So that's how I got started. And then when I got uh, free agent, went to the Buffalo Bills, I was putting kick off and they, and uh, Scott, Scotty Norwood, their kicker was holding mm. out <laughs> and they go, can you place kick them? Well, sure. So I place <laughs> kick for him. And then the special teams coordinator, Bruce Haven, who's passed away, is a dear friend of mine. I got to know him. He goes, why, why don't you become a, he goes, why didn't you place kick? He goes, you're, Place kick, great. He goes, we could use you as a place kicker instead of a punter. I go, well, I had to choose when I went to college, Mm -hmm. which one? And I picked punting, punting and kicking off. So, they, you know, I could also do all three. I was very fortunate. That's really cool. Yep. So that's why, you know, Denver, they got two guys in one game were out. Mm -hmm. So then they had to find backups for both of them. Yeah. So that's why they don't do it now in the NFL because it's too too tough. Yeah. It's a long season. So, but uh, where was I at? Oh, you were holding. You held yep. for Nick Lowry. In training camp. I never held for him. I was trying to figure out why did Nick, uh, I couldn't remember why Nick left. Did they release him? Because they, they uh, they, tra- I, I think they traded him to the Jets when I got here. Oh, really? Okay. I came here. I was here for mini camp. And then we had him and Lynn Elliott. And then they traded him to the Jets. And that's where you came from, right? You were at the Jets. Yeah, and I was came with the Jets. You were a free agent though. When yeah, you came. I was a free yeah. agent. I came yeah, yeah. here, so I played with the Jets ninety one, two, and three. Then I came here in ninety four, and then they traded Nick to New York Got in ninety four. Got it. Okay. After train after mini camp, hmm. and then it was Len Elliott was here. So you had just the, the mini camp with him. That was yeah. It. That was it. That was enough. Oh. See when you when you brought up his name, he made a face. Did you notice? That? No, you I didn't. didn't notice I didn't. That. I wasn't looking. So tell He's me. A, I know I'm different. Look, I don't know him everybody, at all. Everybody's I don't know different. All. Yeah, I know that everybody has their quirks. I mean, I'm not Joe Rogan, but we're pretty close. I mean, there's this is going to get to a lot of people. This is going to get like to like <laughs> at least like 82 people, bro. The 12 but. people that watch me on this, can you go get me a donut and a, a soda, and a quick trip, please? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I told you, I'm not afraid to talk. Right, I know, I know. So, I know which camera I'm looking at. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I will say though, a majority of our listeners obviously reside in the Kansas City metro. Yes, and hey, Nick does a lot of great things for charity. Okay, he well, does. I guess where I was going is Nick was obviously recognized as one of the most prolific yes. place kickers, especially in Chiefs franchise history. Yes, right. Yes. So was what? Uh, what Nick, was your experience with him as a person? He's a little, like I said, everybody's a little different. Yeah. So what's your experience with him? What that you're comfortable with saying? He's a little different. That's what he's comfortable <laughs> that, that's with your, saying. That's your level. Uh, you of know, business. Nick. When I got here, you know, Nick was here for a long time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you know, he had his routine. And the first time I went to hold for Nick, uh, he looked at me. He goes, have you ever held before? Well, yes. He goes, okay. I, he goes, I, he goes, well, let's see you hold. I said, well, Nick, I go, I already held for one guy that's going to be in the NFL Hall of Fame. And Pat Leahy, I guess I can hold for you. Because he was, because him and Pat, oh him and. So the egos are already oh boy. going. He has a big ego. Yeah. Okay. You know, and because, okay. you know, he had a holder that he had for four years in Brian Barker. And he trusted Brian. And I know mm-hmm. that, you know. Mm-hmm. Brian, you know, I got to know Brian. Brian's a good holder. And so Nick didn't know anything about me as a holder, as a person. So he goes, can you hold? And I looked at him. I said, well, I hold for one guy's going to be in the Hall of Fame. And Pat Lay, I guess I can hold for you. Mm-hmm. You know, Pat played 18 seasons. And uh, so I went down and hold, and he, you know, he, I go, how do you want your ball? He told me I hold, put the ball down. He kicked. I said, looked at him. Is that good enough? You know, because I knew enough about him through a lot of different players. What kind of ego he had? So you were trying to put the kibosh on that pretty yes, quick. Yes, I was going to. Yeah, I'm not. I don't. I'm not going to play that BS. Yeah, I'm not going to do that because I'm here. They brought me in for a reason. Yeah, Marty right. and Carl. We're not going to bring somebody in who's who's awful. Yeah, 
Yeah. Right. So to even to, I mean, to ask you if he wasn't like yeah. doing it like a joke, like right. a jab, like a no, little he fun. he was doing it to be serious because, you right. know, right. He, he was Can you worried hold? about. What kind of question is that? He was worried about his kicking and is he still going to be the Nick Lowry that makes all the kicks? Right. You know, because, mm-hmm. you know, when the, uh, was it uh, Armadola? No, it wasn't Armadola. The other kid that came in after Am- Armadola hit that 59 yard. Right. And then Nick has to go out and say something on Facebook. Well, you know, I used to hold the longest record until then, you know. And it's just like, no way he didn't. Yes, he did stuff like that. So Nick always has to push stuff out. Nick did that recently after Wright hit that 59 yarder. So what's he going to say now that Harrison broke it yesterday? Yeah, broke it 62. (laughs) You know, so yeah, because Nick went on there and said, well, I had one like a 56 in such and such part. So, I mean, do you follow Nick Nick, on? So was that on Facebook or where did you see the Twitter? It was like, I can't remember if it was, I I don't have Twitter. Uh, but I think it was might have been on Facebook. You okay. put something out there. So yeah, he always. All right, Jill, you look for that. And the he meantime, always has to put something up about himself, you know. And that's I don't like those type of people. I'm just I appreciate quiet. your honesty. I'm quiet, you know. Mm-hmm. When she asked me to come on this, I I'd love to. Yeah. I don't, you know. You I don't. You appreciate myself. humility. Let's just that's yeah. what it is. It's not about being quiet because you're not necessarily quiet. You're just humble, right? That's you know, really that's I think, the way I was brought up with my mom yeah. and dad. You know. Yeah. I was very humble. Okay. So yesterday, um, it looks like he was at the game. Yeah. Did you see him? Yeah, I saw him. He wears that white jacket with the big KC on it. Yes. Uh, it so everybody like, look at me. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> he wears okay. that jacket. Yeah. Like it's silk or something. He wears it everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But so he did post about the kick and yeah. he just said absolutely beautiful kick. Yeah. And then posted like a, like a, uh, you know, yeah. a link to the story right. about him breaking the record. So that's nice. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. cool. That's no, nice. yeah. Let's see, if, keep going. You'll probably find something. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. <laughs> but Nick is everybody. Everybody has their own little things, you know, and everybody yeah. has their own little quirks. Yeah, and I understand that. You know, I have mine. That's why I was divorced twice. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get into that. We can get into that later. Oh, gosh, but yeah, right. you know, Nick's Nick was a Nick was a hell of a kicker. Yeah. God, he was he was good. You know, something on the line, you know, you could trust Nick to make the kick. Right. Yep. You know, Nick was good. And that's where his ego came to. So you didn't really have to deal with him much then. You said it was just mm-hmm. through training camp and then just he was mini, gone. Mini camp for two days. Okay. Well, then you guys never really had the opportunity to have the ability to grow a relationship. Correct. So your your I guess what I'm saying is your opinion of him is somewhat skewed due to the minute Minimal amount right. of time that you got to spend with Correct. him. Correct. You know, like, like I said, the first thing he asked me, he goes, can you hold? Right. <laughs> well, I'm in the NFL, too, yeah. and I've kicked for, right. or held for, yeah. for, held for Pat Leahy. Yes, yeah, so I guess yeah. I can hold for you. That's, those, I, that was my exact question. So you guys don't ever talk anymore? Like, there's never... I, when I see him at games, if I see him, you know, we're next to each other, I'll say hi to him. And, mm-hmm. yeah, Does he treat you with respect today? Yeah. I mean, he, you know, you know, we say hi to That's each good. other, and we hang yeah. out, you know. Okay. I don't hang out. Am I going to go and hang out with him? No, but if I see him, I'll say hi. If gotcha. he's at the same event, you're not yes. going to shun I'll, him. Right. I'm not right. going to dodge. I don't dodge anybody. I go and say hi to everybody. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. You know, I have, you know, you know, when the, you know, the founders club, I, I always walk around and say hi to all the players and mm-hmm. guys, I, you know, former players and whether they played in the sixties or they played, you know, now I go by and say hi to everybody. Cause I just, right. I'm just. Yeah. Love I, everybody. I, I enjoy saying hi and talking to everybody. She knows I like to talk. I'll sit there. Well, I'll walk around and talk to anybody that talk to me. <laughs> I appreciate that. You know, I'm kind of the same Nick way. comes by and he'll talk to me. I'll talk to him too. Yeah. That's right. You know, and Jan Stanarud, you know, we always sit and talk about, you know, place kicking in the footballs and punting, you know, we, you know, so it's. I don't think that guy gets enough credit just for being the legend that he was from way back in the day, you know, like our, I guess maybe our generation or generations. Mm-hmm. Uh, the younger generations don't know him. That I he was. There were some great Chiefs greats yeah, from way are. back in the day. That they should. I wish that they would be lifted up a little bit more. But that's right. just my opinion. But yeah, with Nick, yeah, he's. I mean, he was a hell of a kicker. Yeah, God, he was good. So let's talk about Lynn Elliott then. Um, so that's where a majority of well, two years. How long yeah, did I was there? Ninety four, ninety five with him. Because two obviously, years. after the Colts playoff game, he's he gone. was done. Yeah. Um. He obviously is a, I'm just going to say it, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, hated man in Kansas City. Um, You're not wrong. Right. I mean, like that name I don't, puts a bad I, taste in everybody's mouth. And look, as you get older, and I'm 47 years old now, I was, you know, 
95 then, so I would have been a 19 years old, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, not as mature emotionally, love the old ball sports, you know, so I'm pissed at this guy. He ruined our chances, you know. Like, I got friends that are my age. I'm 56. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that I, it's still a bad. They, yeah, they, so I guess what I'm trying to do is be a person of that that has more um, empathy. And I'm wanting to ask you: Do you still talk to Lynn? And how is he doing? Um, I haven't talked to him in a long time. Uh, I lost contact with him after they uh, cut him. He changed numbers, and you know, because from what I understand, you know, his number got out, and so he had to change numbers a couple times because people, oh. you know, because I finally got a hold of him. He said he had to change numbers because people got it, and you know, were threatening him and all yeah. sorts of stuff from Kansas City. And you know, I lost contact with him for probably a good eight, ten years, and then found each other on Facebook again. We've talked a couple times, and uh, you know, I wish him the best. Um, he was a good friend of mine, mm-hmm. uh, but to have that happen to somebody, I mean, it's it's horrible mm-hmm. to see somebody. You know, who was doing so well. He was an 80% place kicker. He was, you know, doing really well and just went into the tank. Yeah. As, as the easiest word to say, he went in the tank. You know, he missed. was it that game that put him in the tank or was he on his way there before that? He was on his way before that. Did he or, just, did he get, what do they call it? The, um, what do they call that? It's a term when you just get in your own head. Um, I cannot yeah, I can't it. remember the word. I just say but, he won the tank. Yeah. So, um, but but because it happened a few weeks earlier when he missed, he hit he missed a PAT in Oakland, missed it wide right. Gotcha. You know, then a few weeks earlier he missed it in Oakland. Then I can't remember another because I remember Oakland so well. He got the yips. This is the yeah. word I was looking for. Yeah. So he got the yips basically where he got into his own head. His confidence was shot. Something was was there something going on there more that that you knew on a personal level? Was he having issues at home, or no. was it just all just something happened and then he lost his confidence? He, sir, I, this is my own observation. This is my sure. own personal opinion. Okay. I don't want any psychiatrists getting mad at me or anything, <laughs> but okay. they brought in a sports psychiatrist. Oh, to, really? To talk to us, and Lynn started talking to this guy. All the time. And as soon as he started talking to him, everything fell apart. Everything fell apart. Why did they bring in a psychiatrist? I have no idea. And they go, oh, Louis, we want you to talk to him. I'm like, uh-uh. I go, I'm doing fine. I don't. And they're all, because, you know, Lynn started talking to him. Like, oh, you got to go talk to him. I said, uh-uh. I don't want to think about what I do. For so there game. wasn't any issues prior to the psychiatrist coming in. Was no. this something that happened in the middle of the season? Or? Towards the end of the season, they brought him in. I don't know. So it was towards the end of that 95 season yes. that they brought in the psychiatrist, and there was no. And they were just having talked to different players. Okay, so it wasn't just the it wasn't just, no, the just for It wasn't just for me and, me and Lynn, no. It was for anybody to talk to him. Okay. You know, it was just for anybody. And I don't know the guy's name. Um, and so Lynn started talking to him and then, you know, I started seeing him, his, he started thinking too much and they're all, Lou, you go talk to him. Uh, uh-uh. I have nothing in my head. All I do is catch ball and <laughs> kick it. I don't want to think about it because the more I think about what I have to do when I cross that line, I, I don't want to get the shanks. Yeah. You know, when I start, when I think too much about punting, I think about when I catch it, I catch it, do the, take your steps, kick the ball. And then I start shanking the ball. Yeah. When I pump best is when I, I do all my technical work, technical work during the week on game day. As soon as I cross that line, the only thing I'm thinking about doing is catching the ball and everything else is just, I've done it a million times is just to catch it and just do what I do. And it's just, I don't think about it. Just right. catch it and go. Right. You know, when people ask, well, how'd you do that? You, I didn't think, you know, it's like, you know, you know, when Montana threw the ball to uh, Dwight Clark, you know, what you know, what'd you think? I, it's just reaction. Yep. Instinct. And that's all, that's instinct. And that's all mm-hmm. I did. I didn't want to think about it. And so when, when he gets the yips and, um, and he's going through his struggle, are you talking to him? Like, are you guys on a personal level? You, you said you're good friends. So yeah, are you like, you're trying, see- or you're trying to lift him up. You're like, right. Hey man, what's going on? Like, what, yeah, what was- is he saying to you when he's going through all this? Like, man, I, yeah, I'm all, you're kicking great. Why are you talking to this guy? Because, oh, well, he's getting me to think more about, be more analytical about kicking. And I'm all, you don't need to be. You're you're a great kicker now. You're 80%. Mm-hmm. And then when he started getting the yips, I still remember Derek Thomas comes over to me. He goes, Louie, tell that 
SOB to get away from him. Nick was Nick. Lynn was kicking great until he started talking to him. And Nick and Pat and then Derek Thomas went over actually to that psychiatrist just told him to get away from him because he goes, he was kicking great until you got here. Mm-hmm. Who do you think called was that a Carl move or was that I a Marty no move? Idea. Nobody knows how or why have, this person showed I don't up. Know. I don't know. Was it's there anybody somebody, else affected by that some, person? No, not, not that I know of, because he talked to he talked to a lot of <laughs> different players on the team. But you know, being a kicker or a punter or a golfer, when you start thinking too much about yeah, your you know as a golfer, you know you go get lessons. You think so when you're on the course, you think okay, I got to do this, I got to do this, I got five parts to do before I hit the ball. And what happens? You don't hit the ball. Just you're if you just do all the practice and then just come out and do it, you hit the ball fine. So yeah, that was just something that happened, you know, with the Lynn and I. I feel bad to this day, but you know, it happened to him because it could happen to anybody, mm-hmm. you know. And he's a hated person here in town. Where the year before they loved him because he was kicking so well, and it's just all of a sudden it just it happens, you know. Well, that's what I'm kind of trying to. <clears throat> I'm not trying to be any hero here, so I got to be careful how I say this. But as a person who's challenging myself to have more empathy in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I did hate Lynn. I was a sports hardcore fan, hated him. Like just remember, I remember exactly where I was when this happened. I was going to school at Colby junior college. Um, The weather was shit that day. And I was driving from Marysville, Kansas, my hometown, the five hours to Colby in terrible weather, listening to the game on the radio trying to get back to school before Monday Mm -hmm. and just the rage of me like white knuckling (laughs) that steering wheel, not only in the weather, but now I'm pissed, you know, like there was true deep, dark towards Lynn Elliott. I'm a little bit older now and trying to be more mature and, you know, and I'm like, and how many years later? Yeah. So I was 19. I'm 47 now. So a lot, lot. (laughs) many years, a lot of years later, a lot of of years. years. So I guess my point is, is that, um, you know, as someone who's trying to be more empathetic, I would like to know more about that story because we're all human. Right. And he's a person, maybe he's a father. He's obviously a son and he's somebody who's got feelings and, we all make mistakes, and maybe as Kansas City fans, a few of them, the five or six that will listen to this podcast, you know, maybe, maybe they don't know the whole story. And maybe now you talking about the sports psychologist or psychiatrist yeah. that they brought yeah. in, um, and, and I guess post all of that, and you said that you've reconnected with him, casual conversation here yeah. and there. Have you guys ever revisited that time? Has he I've talked never about, talked about it. I won't bring it up because... That was something that was hard on him. Mm -hmm. That was something that was hard on me because a lot of teammates came up to me and said, get him out of the locker room before we kill him. Ooh. Yes. I'm not going to name names who Mm. told me that because it's not right. But a lot of guys came up to me and said, Louie, you get dressed, take a shower. We need you to get him out of here before we kill him because he said some things. Lended? Yes, he's, I don't know what he said. He said something. Uh, and after that, players came up to me and said, you know, please get him out of here before we kill him. And I'm all, not a problem. Can you? Is there any way you can offer any clarity on what was said I or the I dynamic, knew, the dynamic of it? What, I knew. This I was knew, after the game in the after, locker room. After the game in the locker room. And I he guess piped off and said something to somebody, and it raised the emotion in the locker room. Something about it should never come down to him. Oh, ah. that's what I'm trying to get. That's if, the clarity you know, I'm looking saying, for. You know, if right. you would have comp- you know, if you would have done your job. If you had done your job, we wouldn't be in we this wouldn't situation. Be that close. We were inside. I missed three field goals, but if we would have scored touchdowns instead of you guys not doing your job, mm-hmm. I won't. It's it's right. on me. Right. Gotcha. So he said something. I don't know to who. He said something to somebody, and I don't know who or what, because I was in the shower. And next thing I know, I come out of the shower, and they said, "You need to get him out of here." Mm-hmm. And I'm all okay. And so a few few of the big guys came up, told me that I'm okay. I, I go. Because I heard him popping off, you know, saying, if you guys would have done your job, I wouldn't have to do my job. And I'm all, oh, you don't do that. Just mm-hmm. take ownership. Yes. You know, yeah. We can you, say that kind of stuff watching. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> you know. You can be an armchair quarterback, but you don't yeah. say it to your teammates. Right. 
I'm trying to right. remember. Wasn't Harbaugh the quarterback for the Colts in that game? Yes, it was. Harbaugh, who is now the, the head kid. coach. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Which one? Aren't there Jim, brothers? Jim, Jim, yeah. Jim, who's the head coach yep. for Michigan Wolverines. Yep, and his oh, brother's yeah. head coach for uh, Baltimore, Baltimore Ravens. I know both right. those guys well. Oh, wow. I got to know both of them, you know, after I got done playing. So, yeah, they're real, they're great guys. You know, I've when Jim was coaching out at uh, USD, University of San Diego, I actually called him. I said, hey, I got a punter who wants to go to school there. Can you take a look at him? I go, I think he can punt for you. He goes, you, he, he goes, Louie Kenny? And I'm like, yeah. He goes, okay. Mm-hmm. He goes, I know who you are. I'll take your word for it and let him come be a, a preferred walk-on. Mm. You know, so it's. That's cool. Yeah. You know, and How'd that, that go? The kid made it and pl- punted for him. Yeah. So that was good. But, yeah, just to co- I still remember, the, you know, the comeback kid. Yeah. You know, they were 9-7. and seven, We're 13-3. and three. And mm-hmm. But he was, you know, they, that was his nickname, the comeback kid, because that's all he did. Wherever he went and played, he always yep. came. Mm-hmm. He did something well. He was a real good quarterback. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, that day it was 9 degrees at kickoff. Mm-hmm. Gosh, it was cold. Um, yeah, it, the ball wasn't flying well. Their kicker, Kerry Blanchard, who I played with in New York, the New York Jets, Kerry Blanchard was their kicker for the Indianapolis Colts. He was one for two when Lynn Elliott was 0 for three. Okay. And when he was out there, he was jumping up and down because our coach, special teams coach told us to compete. He's out there jumping up and down saying, compete, compete. I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, coach told me to compete, so I'm competing. <laughs> All righty then. So that was, and so as soon as they snapped the ball, I put it down. He kicked it. I got him walked off. I didn't, I didn't see the kicks. I knew he missed it because I already knew it was already in his head. It was a 40-yarder right hash and caught the ball. I put it down. He kicked it. I got up and turned around. I didn't. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I already knew it was already in his head that I, I knew he was going <clears> to. <throat> what was, it. what was, gosh, I am trying to keep all, I'm going to have to start taking notes here because I've got so many <laughs> thoughts that I'm like jumbled this. What was Lynn's reply? Obviously he's pissed off. He's hurt. He's probably got a roller coaster of emotions yep. after missing what I think was three field goals in that game. He was over three. It was like a, <clears throat> I think they were like off the head, top of my head. I think it was like a 28, 32. And the last one was a 40 yarder on the right hash. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, it was. It's not like we're trying to kick a 62 yard right. franchise no. record. Um, no. Anyway, people, so. And people go, why didn't you kick it? I said, that's not my job. Yeah. Because I could have probably done at least one out of three. Yeah. Hmm. That's all it would have taken. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so. Uh, so, wait, what you're saying is we can be mad at you because you could have done it and you didn't. <laughs> wasn't my job. Can I, can yeah. I transfer my. I, it I wasn't know, my job. I'm kidding. My I'm job kidding. was the holder. I know. I'm just teasing you. But, you know, I, I, I might have held the ball upside down. Oh, <laughs> Laces gosh. out, Dan. Laces <laughs> out, Dan. So di- <laughs> There's a left-handed football, too. You know that? <laughs> don't. I'm, I might ask dumb questions, but I don't believe that. <laughs> I don't believe that. No, uh, my buddy Brett Favre asked the ball boy that. He goes, hey, is that a left-handed football? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's so funny. <laughs> So, yeah, have you seen that commercial where he did that? No, I didn't. It's like a commercial because, you know, they do a thing on Brett Favre and they show Brett, hey, ask him, is that a left-handed quarterback? Is that a left-handed football? <laughs> the kid looks I've heard of ball. left-handed cigarettes. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm. Those are actually called joints. Yeah. Oh. If you ever ha- hear anybody refer to a left-handed cigarette, that's I don't, probably a joint. I don't know anything. I don't do drugs. I have never done them. I don't know anything about them. Well, I don't know that marijuana is considered drugs now anymore. Yeah, I know. <laughs> my daughter's, uh, my daughter's, dad, it's okay. It's a drug. Yeah. No. It, mm. Okay. Anyway, we're getting off topic. <laughs> yeah. So oh boy. You, that's another podcast for another squirrel. day. Yeah. I know. No, right? deer. deer. Yes. Deer. Yes. Look at him. Four of them. Um, there's the altercation the in the, the yes. well, we're back to Lynn. Mm-hmm. There's the altercation. We're going to talk about this and then we're going to take a break and we're going to move on uh, and come back and tell more chief stories. At some point though, in the show, I want to get into what happens to Louis Aguiar post um, football and the, you know, you had a different bunch of different business ventures and, and you know, you kind of alluded to being married twice that didn't work out. So we want to dive a little bit more in your personal life, but uh, we'll get into that later in the show. That's just a little promo for you to stick around. The Lynn Elliott altercation in the locker room after that playoff game. Um, they're pissed. He says it shouldn't have come to that. They're asking you to take Lynn, get him out of the locker room before they quote unquote kill him. Yes. Um, what is his reply? Is he scared? Is he, or what's his reply to you? Or is he like, no, screw them. I'll, I'll you know, 
F those guys. No, I just or, said, or, Lance, and, and how did yeah. you, how, what did that look like when you're trying to get him out of there? Are you actually escorting him out or is it like, Hey, you better get out of here. These guys are going to kick your ass. Um, I got out of the shower. Lynn's locker's right next to mine. I said, Lynn, I need you to hurry up and take a shower because a lot of guys are not very happy right now. And I said, we need to get you out of here before something happens. He took a shower, and I just put my arm, I put my arm around him because I was. You felt I, bad for him. I felt really bad for him. I put my arm around him, and we, and we walked, and I walked him out of the locker room, and we walked out to our car. You know, and I was. What conversations were taking place during that I walk? Put, I put my arm around him, and, you know, I just remember saying that, you know, it could happen to anybody. I go, it's not you. I, and I go, yes, you, you are right what you said. You know, if everybody else did their job, it should not have come down to you. Yeah. But it came down to you as your job to make the kicks, and you didn't do your job today. Yeah. You know, and I, I explained, I said that to him while walking out. I said, we all had jobs, and you didn't, you didn't do your job today. And he goes, I know. And mm-hmm. so it was, it was a tough, long walk, you know, yeah. up the tunnel, yeah. you know, had my arm around him just because I knew it was not easy because my other buddy was kicking for Indy, and he was one for two. And the field, the ground was frozen. People were slipping, and the ball's hard as a rock. Yeah, and I remember I hit a ball, and I crushed it. It went barely went forty yards, and it was like a four two hang time. That same ball in September, you know, was going to be a sixty yard punt. We you know with a you know four nine hang time. Yeah, it was just that much difference in the in the weather. But yeah, I said you know, you know, you had a job today to do, and you didn't do it. Yeah, and so I walked him out, and we talked, and. Um, we talked a little bit after that, then, you know, a lot of they, people found his number and he just started getting death threats and stuff. He changed his number. Oh my so gosh. I, you know, yeah, fans were, that's crazy. They, they found his home address and sent his stuff to his parents about, you know, yeah. That's cr- guys. Seriously yes, though. It's, yeah. it's football. Like I know. it's a game. It's a game. And now here's a kid who was literally still a kid. He was 20, you know, 25, 26 years old at this time. And now, basically, his career was done. And was it? Yeah, that's, that was going to be my next question. Yeah. He played, I think he won, he played one, I think he got picked up by Minnesota and played a, a little bit there, then got cut from them. Hmm. And, but yeah, basically, at 26 years old. He never got the yips, and it was yep, already in his head. It was done. Wow. You brought up another person <clears throat> that kind of went through the same thing, um, Scott Norwood. Yeah. yeah, same thing kind of happened. To, well, not exactly the same no, thing, but he missed thing. a game-winning Super Bowl in the Super, Super Bowl. Bowl. Yeah, mm-hmm. and um, that, forty-seven yarder right hash, and he yeah. missed it wide right, and that's yep. when they that was their first loss to the the New Giants. York Giants. Yeah, I remember watching that at home. Yep, and uh, I, and that they, was the Super Bowl during Desert Storm too. Yeah. I think I think that's the Super Bowl yeah. where Whitney uh, sang sang the national anthem. Yep. Oh, really? Yep. Yeah, and everybody and seeing there. The city of Buffalo and the team surrounded Scotty and said, "Hey, you're our guy. You're the you help us get, you help us get it. You help get us here. You know." And they Lynn loved was him. too new, and they loved if him. that would have happened. If that would have happened to uh, Nick Lowry, mm-hmm. I think it would have been a different story. Nick yeah. had already had the years there where he had you know yeah. proven himself and it had the tenure. You know, yeah. Lynn was that was his second year, right? Or that was, was that his first sec- year? Second year here because he was in. Dallas, when Dallas won their Super Bowl, I think he was there for two years, and after that got cut, and then we picked him up. Gotcha. Because hmm. he was there in 91, 92. Then he, I think he got cut after the 92 season, and then we picked him up as a free agent in 94. Okay. And mm-hmm. I, that's when I came here. Okay. Mm-hmm. So yeah, he was out of football. Then he can't got. Then we picked him up. So I never heard the story before about the sports psychiatrist that yeah. came in there, and and you obviously your opinion, and you stated that clearly that I it's your opinion that that my you opinion. yeah that you think that that guy came in, got into his head, and ever since I that, really do. He didn't even even Derek him. Thomas, you said yeah. thought that. Even DT went over to him and told him we're in Oakland. DT went up to him and said, "Get that f away from him." Yeah. yeah. So yeah, DT saw it. I was good friends with DT, and you know, it's just for DT to do that. Yeah. He was pissed. Yeah. And DT doesn't do a lot of things like that. And he was a little ticked off. Sure. Sure. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, man. There's so much to cover. We're already 48 minutes into oh this thing. Oh my gosh. I know, right? 48 oh minutes? My gosh. 48 minutes. We're, we, we got a lot more to cover too. So hang on for that. I'm talking with Louis Aguiar, episode 21 of the Papa Ron podcast. We're going to revisit some of his, uh, some more of these old chief stories, his playing days, and then get into his personal life, talk about different business ventures and what he's doing now. It's happening next on the Papa Ron podcast.
Attention. You're listening to the Papa Ron Podcast. Get involved with the show. Wow, really? Ask questions and leave comments or complaints. Woo! Nice. Call or text 816-558-6389. That's 816-558-6389. Now, back to the show. Here again, your host. Yes. Great. Showtime. Ronnie Phillips. And Jillian Gregg. One of these days, I'm going to get all that imaging <laughs> updated. It's okay. I'm a dad of three kids, two under the age of two years old, and I'm just... It's okay. It's one of the reasons why we didn't do a podcast last week is because I was just trying to get caught up on everything. Anyway, it's, it's so okay. cool. So cool to have Louis Aguiar in my home. So I good know. to be in my home. Like, Once I walked in, this house is amazing. Oh, it's not that. It's not that great. It's uh, what we like it, but uh, yeah. Oh, it's it's fine. Well, yeah. so what do you want to say? Yeah, you're right. It is. It's pretty it's awesome. So awesome. It's pretty great. Thanks. Appreciate it. So uh, you mentioned in the little break there about questions and comments, and we have some. Do you want to? Yeah. We, can we get? Can we yeah, get for okay. sure. So um, Maria says, just wants to say that you're a wonderful person. Thank um, you. Got lucky enough to work with you for a few years. So miss you. That's Maria. Uh, Rich is the one that wants to know about the fake punt pass play that you threw. So we want to talk about that. I'm but, not sure I remember that. But Lane uh, wants to know, has two questions. And they're kind of, I mean, they could be like lengthy answers. Maybe not. I don't know. Uh, what made you so successful for so long? And then what did you do every day to work on your craft? What made me, what, what was the first question? <clears throat> what made you so successful for so long? What made me so successful for so long? Not successful, <laughs> but rather successful. I know where your head was so going good, there. So good. <laughs> so, I have yeah. a hard time saying that word. Successful. Okay. I have a hard. That's there's okay. some words I have. I had, I, in first and second grade, I was, I had speech class. Oh, okay. Because I couldn't pronounce some wor- letters okay. and words and kids used to make fun of me and call me. You, you know, had a be, speaking disability? Yes. Okay. I didn't start speaking until I was four, so I t- started talking oh, really? later. Interesting. Interesting. I had three older brothers. Look at you guys. I just did that. I know. Oh. I, I have three older brothers. Okay. I'm the youngest of four boys. Mm-hmm. So I just used to point right. and grunt, and my brothers And they would, would talk for you, yeah. yeah. But I didn't have to talk. Yep. So I talked late, so I had a speech impediment, and I had speech class, and kids used to call me the good old R word, retarded. Mm. Oh. So, yeah. Well, it's not true. So that's when I was in first, second, third, fourth huh. grade. Yes, I... Okay, well, it's we still, don't... So it's still, successful. It's, we don't so have to use... I, I you can point at me, I'll say it. Successful. successful. What made you successful? Um, <clears throat> working hard every day, working on my craft. Yeah. Okay. Um, but there had to have been... Okay, so I'm going to go back just a little bit. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, at some point in time in your life, you find out you have a natural ability for kicking a ball. Was that from playing soccer? Yes, I played soccer all the way up until ninth grade, and I got cut from the ninth grade soccer team. Oh, what? that's like, kind of like a Michael Jordan story when he got <laughs> cut from freshman basketball. Yeah, I got cut from the soccer team and my older brother was a senior. He was, oh, good. You get to come off for wrestling today. I'm all, OK. Did so you I, wrestle? So I wrestled I, in high school. I played football. I wrestled and then I played baseball. I did that for four years of high school. My freshman year, uh, junior college, Chabot Junior College, I did the same thing. I played football. I wrestled, played baseball. Wow. Oh, and my then gosh. And my sophomore year, I played football. I got a scholarship, then I went to Utah State. Okay. And, okay, what college funny. did you say? What junior college? I went to Chabot, C-H-A-B-O-T. Oh, yeah. Somebody, somebody mentioned that on yeah, here. I went to Nathan. Chabot junior college. So you were a gladiator. Yes. Where yeah. was the, Where's that at? Chabot, that's in Hayward, California. Okay. Hmm. And I'm actually inducted into their football hall of fame. As at, you should be. At Chabot. And then in March of this year, I was just inducted into the – Junior College Football Hall of Fame uh, of State of California. <laughs> That's awesome. So wow. there's like nine. There, I think there's probably about 100 junior mm-hmm. colleges now. And I was inducted into the Hall of Fame into the State of California. So to, awesome. get, to get back to the original question with yeah. what made you successful, I wanted I to, I wanted, you worked really hard I, I, every day, but I mean, did uh, you have a, a kicking coach or somebody yes, who really helped you? I had Ray Pelfrey, who was my kicking coach out of, uh, at the time he lived in Reno, Nevada. He has since, since passed. Uh, Ray Pelfrey was, I call him the godfather of punting and kicking. Okay. Hmm. Um, he, he, he played for the Packers and... The Giants, and I believe he punted for the Packers. Ray Pelfrey did. And then when I was a senior in college at Utah State, they asked me to go see him, and I did. 
And he helped me work on my punting because I wasn't, you know, swinging. Like I was a, like I said, soccer player mm-hmm. swinging my leg across my body instead of coming straight through. Mm-hmm. And so I met him and he talked, helped me work on my craft of kicking my leg straight through the ball hmm. instead of cutting across the ball. Because when I cut across the ball, I was shanking it a lot instead mm-hmm. of coming straight through the ball. So he helped me out with that. Mm-hmm. Um, so if it wasn't for him, I would have never made it in the NFL because he saw potential in me and he worked with me and helped me out quite a bit. And so punting, I worked on bringing my leg straight through the ball and I used to go to Reno and work with him all the time. And I, even in your, this, this is like, this was my senior in college. Okay. And then it took me three years to make it it into into the NFL. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. I came out in 89. I came out of the draft of 89. Did not get drafted. Got picked up by the Bills for training camp in eighty nine and ninety, and got cut both years. And I kept going back to Ray Pelfrey. And gotcha. then they had this new league come out called NFL Europe. Yep. It was well, actually, when I played. It was called uh, World League of American Football (WLAF). And then they changed it to NFL Europe. Yep. I remember and that. I was the first punter drafted into NFL Europe history in 1991 by the Barcelona Dragons. Hmm. I played for them. 10 games and then we had a playoff game and then we went to the world bowl and lost to uh we lost to uh the london monarchs and and at wembley stadium Mm. and then i got picked up by the jets signed a contract with them went to training camp with them in 91 because i played february to june of 91 with uh barcelona came home on the 10th of june signed the contract with the jets went to training camp with them a month later uh, and made the team with the Jets, and I. That's how I made. And then the next ten years, I used to went out to. I went out to Ray Pelfrey every year and worked with him on the off season. And I actually moved to Reno to be closer to him to make myself better, so I could work with my with my godfather punting and kicking. I worked with him wow. on the off season. I'd go, we'd be on the field uh, January, February, March. I would not kick. I would lift. And do all my drills that Ray had me do, and mm-hmm. the, one, the other ones that I I, I made up and worked on, uh, and then I would kick in the month of uh, April to get ready for training camp in May, and then I'd, I'd kick at many first week of April or kick the whole month of April. We had usually had mini camp the first weekend of May. Took the month of May off, then I started always June first, six weeks before training camp. I start kicking again, and I'd lived in Reno, and I'd go to the field with Ray three days a week. We'd go out there and work on stuff, and work on my punting, and videotape me, and hmm. you know, work on my elbow, keeping it, you know, keeping here. We made up little gadgets and stuff, you know. And sometimes I'd bend my wrist, so he made a little thing here to keep my hand straight, like a so little. So that plastic. way you're dropping the ball straight. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. you know, a little plastic thing that here that had a Velcro on it, so my hand can't twist. So my ball, huh. it, my thing would come straight, so I'd keep it straight. Oh yeah, we did. All sorts of stuff. Yeah, it's um, fascinating to hear because I think people who don't, <clears throat> who are just kind of pseudo football fans, think you just walk onto the field and kick the ball. There's no. so many mechanics that well, are involved. I think you know, besides hitting a baseball, you know, you hit a ball, you know, coming at you 80, 90, sometimes 100 miles an hour. You don't, you know, you're trying to watch the spin of the ball. I mean, that thing's coming at you so fast. It's like. You know, point two seconds. You got to either hit yeah. the ball or let it go. And right. It just happens so quick. And same thing with punting a football. We catch it from the time we catch it to the time we punt it. We have one point two seconds, yeah. and we have sometimes we have ten guys rushing at us. Mm-hmm. So, and then you got to hit a perfect ball. You know, they want it forty five yards. You know, four eight hang time and making a fair mm-hmm. catch. And then you have wind coming at you right mm-hmm. to left, mm-hmm. and that blows it inside. Mm-hmm. So I mean, there's a lot of a lot of moving parts, a lot, lot of moving, a lot of moving parts in punting football. So I moved to Reno, like I was answering this question, yeah. that I moved to Reno to work on my craft with Ray Pelfrey, and wow. another good friend of mine here who lived here in town, Kelly Goodburn. So when I came, I came to Kansas City because my friend Kelly Goodburn lived here. And he helped me out in Reno also because he was a professional punter at the time I was trying to get into the NFL. I met Kelly. And then when I came to Kansas City, it was great because I had a, he would come to the games and he had another set of eyes because mm. the special teams coach in the NFL, they don't know kicking. They know how to do specialists. Mm-hmm. Uh. They know how to you know do design special teams plays mm-hmm. and stuff, but a lot of them don't know mm-hmm. anything about punting and kicking. So it was nice having Kelly there because after I'd punt – he would come down. We'd sit and talk. You know, at the you know on the front row, we'd talk, and then I'd get the chance going. If I got another chance going punt, I'd fix it and hit a good ball. Mm-hmm. So it was nice to have 
Kelly here to help me out. Hmm. And Kelly lived here. So when I, out during the week, I would punt a practice and I'd go to his house and we'd work on stuff in his backyard and work on punting. I did it even here in town. I get done with practice. I said, oh, I wasn't putting the ball well today. I do this or this. And so he goes, oh, okay, let's, you know, remember what Ray said. So he would, you know, we'd all go back to what Ray said. And, okay, I got to keep my ball here. I got to keep my elbow here. I got to keep the ball flat here. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as the, I, you know, as soon as the elbow comes out, the ball is inside my knee. Yeah. See, I'm here. Yep. yep. Elbow goes out. So I always had yep. to work on this. Gotcha. So I'd go to Kelly's house and we'd work on drills at his house or in his backyard he had, all, had these you know he has these old oak trees so we put <laughs> balls and hit the oak trees and they come back down his yard yeah oh he's like God. having his own net yeah what an answer okay yeah. so again before we get to the fake pump pass uh play and also these rings that are just if you're watching on the video you can see these you we'll, we'll get we'll get to those we'll get to those because they're sparkling and again things. if you're listening to the audio audio version of this watch it on spotify or youtube exactly um we had one just come in just a couple minutes ago okay so the name is rob okay rob miller and he says not only did louie have <laughs> you made a face not only did, did i it, think if this is the same kid why well, i went to college with him okay he says not only did did louie have a huge leg he also had a better arm than all of our quarterbacks at USU. Ask him about the time we bet the quarterbacks that he could throw farther than them. You knew this was who this guy was. Yeah. <laughs> he was a he was a D lineman for us. Oh my god. Yeah. As soon as you That's said so that, cool. I'm all Rob Miller. Rob Miller, yeah. 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 I could I played like I said, I play when I said I played baseball. <clears throat> yeah, I play I was a pitcher. Okay. Oh. Wow. I threw ninety one. So I, I can see that. I was, <clears throat> Especially with as tall as you are. Yeah, I threw ninety one, mm -hmm. and I would, uh, you know, I'd throw the footballs with the quarterbacks, and we'd have a, we'd always have a throwing contest, <laughs> and they saw me throw the ball the first time. They're all uh, not no more. <laughs> I got, I got, the only quarter there's only two quarterbacks that could out throw me. The guys who I who I personally played with. Okay. There's other quarterbacks who would throw the ball farther. Sure. Uh, but yeah, uh, Brett Favre could throw the ball farther than I could, and so could Brownie Nagel. I played with the Jets. He was. Ronnie Nagel was a second round draft pick out of L uh, I was gonna say LSU, but it's not LSU. Lou uh, Louisville. Okay. Yep. yep. Louisville. Yep. So it's not Louisville State University. It's just Louisville. Yeah. Louisville. Louisville Cardinal. So yeah. Here comes a dumb. We should have a. We should have like a certain sound effect when I'm gonna ask a dumb <laughs> football question. So did it ever cross your mind to try to be a quarterback if you could throw that? <laughs> if you could throw that that well, uh, or do you wish you had? Tried to be a quarterback? Is well, that I, I played quarterback in high school, but when I was getting recruited, right. I was all-league punter and kicker. Okay. So I was getting recruited to punt and kick, and I didn't okay. get recruited to play quarterback okay. anymore when I left high school. I'm like, okay, so that's – I could throw the football 75 yards So is this air. is this why this fake – Yes. Fake pass thing happened. Yes. Okay. So I don't. I don't know this story. I think I've seen the video, but I like. I don't know when it happened. I don't know the game. I don't know the situation. Well, I don't know the score. I don't know the whole thing. Yeah. So tell the story. And we'll we'll. You said you can maybe put the video I, in. Yeah. We'll we'll find okay. it. Okay. So are you looking for the video? Yes, sir. All right, so here's what we'll do. So, so this this is a mark in the episode where we're getting ready to show the video yeah. of Louie in this <laughs> fake. Oh, you, you need some readers? Yes. Here you go. I forgot. I, I left my one point two fives in now, the wait a in minute. Those are wait one point. Those are one two fives. He remembers like all these details, right? He's like sitting here and all, like this whole time. I'm like, I yeah. wish I could have a memory like that because he remembers these things. I think it was seven degrees, and I think yes. the ground was and the wind was. Uh -huh. And now he now he's this this infamous play. So this and is he's the looking at what is it called the fake fake. Uh, it was a fake pass. Fake punt pass play is what is fake what pump. Rich called it when all he right. asked the question. <clears throat> so we got a video of it, and yeah. we're gonna play it right now. Niners Chiefs look to win their seventh straight dome game. They pulled out all the stops as punter Louie Aguiar's surprise pass set an NFL record with 20 minutes of hang time. Kevin Lockett. Oh, no way. Kevin Lockett, K yeah. State, baby. Yeah, Kevin Lockett. We got tackled at the one yard line. Thank God. That was against Seattle. Seattle. Kevin, that was Kevin Lockett's first NFL catch. No, no way. way. Now his son, yep. Tyler, plays first for Seattle. Seattle. No way. <clears throat> of course, they both played at Kansas yeah. State University. So, so has a, uh, I don't want to say this wrong, has a punter ever completed a touchdown pass in the NFL? Yeah, there's been quite a few of them. It yes. happens a lot. But they run fake passes and 
Okay. But that was the only thing that was run like that back then. And the reason why it happened, um, I was I watched a lot. I watched a ton of video when I was playing. My first coach when I was with the Jets, Al Roberts, always gave me, a, you know, back in the VHS. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I know. I still have some. <laughs> so do I. I got, all, yeah. I, got all, I got almost all my games on VHS at my house. Oh, my oh gosh. My. And so he'd always give me a VHS tape that he <laughs> made up, and I'd always have to look at it against the team that we were playing to see if I could find anywhere I could run a, 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 an onside kick, right or left, mm -hmm. uh, a fake punt or fake field goal, whatever. So I looked at tons of video because of uh, Al Roberts. And so when I was with the Chiefs, I saw that every time – I call them flyers. Some guys call them gunners. The outside guys out go down, Kevin Lockett. Hmm. They would run down, and at the 20-yard line, the defense would always pull off, and our guys would always have from the 20-yard line to the goal line, nobody was on them. I kept looking at video and looking at video from, you know, that year. And then I looked at it again. Uh, that was in 97. Uh, I looked at video in 96, and they did the exact same thing two years in a row, and it was huh. the same special teams coach. And – so I showed it to Mike Stock, and I said, Mike, I think we can – he was my special teams coordinator. I said, Mike, look at this. They pull off at the 20-yard line. Our guys have carp launch. They can run right on down. I go, if I throw a pass <laughs> and we can make it look like a – you know, yeah. snap it, I'll throw like a punt and have, you know, them catch it and we can score a touchdown or, you know, get tackled or something. He goes, no, they can tell if you throw the ball. I said, I don't think so. I go, so today at practice, the, f the first one I'll punt, the next three I'll throw. Ask to Mark Vanover oh, yeah. if, I, if I punted it or threw it. And they asked to Mark, he goes, no, he, he punted all those. No way. He could, could he go, yeah, to Mark goes, he punted all those because he goes, no one can throw the ball that high or that far. Well, yeah, I can, I can. <laughs> and, wow. Uh, How far was it? Uh, the ball was on the 36 yard line. So I threw it. It was, it was like a 4 2 hang time, went up. Made it look like a punt. I threw it a high, and it mm -hmm. made it turn over, look, mm -hmm. make it look like a punt. Mm -hmm. And what happened was, I'll show it to you, they had a linebacker who came up, saw me throw it, and it was up there so long, he had time to turn around and run down and almost deflect the ball. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. So the linebacker saw me throw it, so he turned around and ran 30 yards and tried to knock it down. Wow. So that's how and that was the was only time there. you guys ever tried that? Yeah, that was the only time. Oh. The, next, the next year, they outlawed that play. Oh, no way. Are you serious? Yeah, because now, because back then, well, they didn't outlaw it, but now, because back then, if I threw it to Kevin, there'd be pass interference if they hit him. Now, there's no pass interference if you throw something like that to your uh, your flyer or your gunner that runs down the field. Oh. Yeah. Huh. They didn't outlaw it, but they changed the rules. Yeah. Oh. So, yeah. So, Kevin could go up and catch it, and if he would have got pushed, it would have been pass interference. Huh. But he went up and caught it. And got tackled at the one, and the then one, yeah. next play, Marcus Allen went in for a one-yard touchdown. And Danny Salamua, who you mentioned earlier, yeah. uh, was standing next to the head coach, Dennis Erickson, who was the head coach for Seattle, and he looked at him and he goes, Louie used to do that all the time in practice, throw the ball like that. And Erickson goes, why didn't you tell me? This? Well, they never thought we'd do it in a real game. Uh. I didn't realize Dan was playing for Seattle then. Yeah, Dan, oh. he, left, he was free agent and went to Seattle in 97. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And so wow. he looked at Dan and he goes, yeah, Lou used to do that in practice. <laughs> why didn't you tell us? Anybody was all, I never th thought they would do it in a game. Oh, my gosh. What, year, what, that, what year was that? 1997. Yeah, 1997. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That was a good wow. year. Wow. Yeah. Uh, we went 13-3 that year, and we lost to Denver, and they yeah. won the Super Bowl that year. Mm -hmm. That's when we had Rich Gannon as our starting quarterback. Oh, that's another sore topic. <laughs> <laughs> Louis' face just says it all. Like it if, does. If, you, if you're just listening, so Elvis you might Gerbach, wanna... That's an Elvis Gerbach year, right? So Elvis Gerbach oh. gets hurt. So for <laughs> the Elvis Gerbach was 4-2. Rich Gannon comes in, goes nine and one, because he then, broke his collarbone, and then Marty brings him back and starts Elvis, and we lose. It wasn't Marty. It wasn't Marty. I think it came. You think from of Carl because he was. They were paying him three and a half million dollars. Yeah, and they were paying Rich like half a million. Yeah, mm. so and then Rich wanted, ends up going to freaking the Raiders, the Raiders and yeah. just smoking us every single yeah. year. Rich was Rich. Rich was a better quarter. I'm gonna. Oh class. yeah, Rich was a better quarter. Yeah, if everybody was, knew that. If, Rich would have, if Rich would have been our quarterback in 1997, in the playoffs, we would have won the Super Bowl that year. 
That's just my own. I talked to a friend of mine who played for Denver, and they said that Shanahan said that if we ever get a free shot on Elvis Gerback, do not take it. Take him down very gingerly. Because we don't want to play Rich Gannon. Correct. Because they go, he's too mobile, we can't stop him. Yeah. Uh, and I, you look at video, if you watch the players back then, they didn't try and take Gerback out of the game. They hit him, but they didn't try and kill him. I remember as a fan thinking, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Why right. are we putting Elvis back in there? He hasn't played majority of the season. He, he was 4-2. and two. He got hurt. I guess a half of the season. Yeah, he got hurt week seven, I think, because mm-hmm. he was 4-2. and two. Rich mm-hmm. comes in, and Rich goes 9-1. and one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He was just unstoppable. Yeah. This makes me want to watch old Chiefs football games. Where can I do that? You can go to my There's, house. I have everything. In my house. <laughs> we'll break out the VHS. Oh, right. You can go to my house. Right. Hey, right. I got right. I got boxes. <laughs> I can't even lift the boxes that are so heavy now. I bet. I, I, I got boxes of all my games from uh, all the way up until 1998. I have every game on VHS in my oh house. Oh my gosh! If I was crazy. to predict, predict rather. Uh, yeah, oh, I, shoot! No, you weren't it. You weren't. I was going to predict your favorite. The, the favorite, your most favorite game with the Chiefs. But I was going to do that incorrectly because you weren't with the Chiefs. And I was going to say the, the playoff game against the Oilers, but that was in 93 and you so came in 93. 94. Yeah. Yep. So what was your favorite game with the Kansas City Chiefs? 1994, Monday Night Football. Oh, I Chiefs, know. Broncos. At and, Mile High. At Mile High. And oh, Montana yeah. brought us back. Oh, yeah. And oh, talk scored to me. with eight seconds. Preach, baby. Preach. Scored with eight seconds to Willie Davis. And Willie Davis made that little tiptoe, caught, the, caught in the corner of the end zone. He made that little yep. tiptoe in the corner of the end zone. <laughs> Touchdown, Chiefs. And we didn't have to hear incomplete yes. from, the, from the Denver Broncos fans. Yes. Was, that was, out of all the games I've ever played, that's my favorite NFL game. I, 1994, wow. Monday Night Football. Uh, what was the temperature? It wasn't that bad, was it? No, I had a short sleeve. I had a long sleeve on, so it was probably about 45 that? degrees. I remember it. It was about 45 what? degrees. Here's why I remember The it. only time I wore sleeves is if it got below 50 degrees because I, I wanted to show off my, my arms. Yeah. <laughs> I used to be pretty big. Oh Welcome gosh. to the gun show of yes. Louie Aguiar. Louis. Yes, I used, I, I'm, I'm serious. I, I worked my tail off for that, so I'll, yeah. Well, good for you. I want. I remember that game because you have to understand that during that time, John Elway was, you talk about comeback kid, that guy right. would always come back to... Are we showing? You showing, <laughs> showing off the off arms? The guns. I was gonna go look at pictures. I see. I see. I see. Are you flexing? I see. Oh my gosh! Yeah, look, you are ripped. I used to be. Yeah, I had seventeen half inch arms when I played. Wow. Now I'm. Yeah, no. So people measure their arms. That's a that's a thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I want to see how big uh, my I arms was. have never been big enough to be worth measuring. Yeah. I used, um, uh, yeah, I was. Yeah, I did that when I was you know back, back when I was playing. You know, I wanted to lift and work out, and I didn't want to get injured. And Bring that hard. microphone a little closer to you. I wanted to work out and mm-hmm. lift, so when I made tackles, I didn't get injured. Sure, makes sense. And I made a lot of tackles. Let's uh, let's get back to football. Yes. Sir. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's so, wipe her chin off. She was drooling a little bit. We saw my. I don't, I'm not just looking at old pictures now. Yeah. So, I don't, so don't John, mind me. John Elway. Oh, I want to get back to the Monday Night Football game. John Elway. Hey, John Elway fun. used to come. I mean, think about how he came back against the Browns in playoffs games. He did that twice. Yep. You think about all the times he came back against the Kansas City Chiefs when yep. we would go and score, and there would be a minute and thirty seconds left. And he would still find a way to come back and win. And this was the first time and then doing it in their stadium yep. on Monday night. And this was before Sunday night football yep. and Thursday night football. Right. Monday night was like, that was, that was, that was the, the thing. Pinnacle. That was the that thing. Was the thing. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're playing on Monday night football, you're playing your rival, you're playing in their stadium. And yeah. now you've got the golden boy, John Montana, Joe Montana yeah. playing for you. And he does the John Elway and brings back they, the Broncos go down to score, yeah. take the lead. And now Joe's got basically a minute 13 or a minute 16. It was not a lot yeah, of time no, left. It was like, I think by like, yeah, by like like minute 20, maybe? was it? Yeah, but it wasn't much. And right. Go the length of the field, right? Score a touchdown at the end to win the game with, with no eight seconds. T- eight seconds. There you go. Or Willie Davis. Seconds, like that, yeah. Tiptoes in. I still remember hearing Mitch Holtis's yeah. call. On that, that was that was the first time Marty ever won in Mile High. That's true too. I forgot about that. Wow. Mm-hmm. I bet you have some good Marty stories. Uh, I love Marty to death. Yeah. I never got to meet him. He was, he was a lot of 
the players either loved him or hate him, and a lot of them loved him. And why would they hate him? Why would people hate him? Because you get cut. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, I was like, I, I'm like, I don't think I've ever. I mean, Marty uh, was very loved. The players yeah. loved him. I he was, was a I players thought. coach. Yes, he was a players mm-hmm. coach. I, I love Marty. Yeah. I love Marty. Mm. Um, I remember seeing videos of like. Um, he I'm, so, I'm so geeking out. Yes, that's where I was going he with this. So he was very that mo- he would cry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He was kind of like a Dick for meal. Yes, yeah. they're yeah, yeah. they're in the same mold. The I, I remember, never played for Dick, but yeah, Dick would get so emotional he would start crying, and so would Marty. They were both out of the same mold. I remember mm. seeing a video with with Marty going up. I don't know if this is like an NFL films thing. It probably is because mm. they were really good at capturing those moments when. Derek is having a bad game or something and he's pissed off and Derek is sitting off to the side by himself and Marty comes over and puts his arm around him and hugs him and is basically saying, look, man, I know you're pissed, but we got to get over this. And, you know, mm-hmm. he's lifting him up and he's like talking to him yeah. like it's his son. Yeah. And mm-hmm. you could just feel like Marty had yeah. a father figure presence with his team. He did. I saw when he talked, yeah, Derek was sitting on his helmet. Yep. He was all pissed off and he came over and put his hands and started talking to him. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Marty, you know, if I had a bad punt, Marty would come over and, you know, hey, you're all right. You know, you're one Let of the you best have. partners in the NFL. You're fine. Just forget about that and let's go on the next one. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. He was just, mm. you know, you could, go, you could go talk to him about anything, you know, family um, or playing or anything. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. So, I mean, when my grandmother died, I had to go tell him and it was after a Monday night game and I was, I was in tears and he's all, why are you crying? I'm all, my grandmother just passed away. Mm. And uh, and he and I go. I need to fly home tomorrow. He goes. Okay, not a problem. He goes. Family comes first. Mm. And I still remember talking to him and getting on the bus. And I'm I'm crying. And you know you know my grandmother passed away. And I just it hurt. And so sure. yeah, he, he you know he took he he held me like I was his son mm. when I told him that. You know, and I flew home the next day and went to my grandmother's funeral. You know, mm. and came back a few days later. So. This is probably going to be a distasteful question, so I almost want to apologize in advance. But there are rumors out there in the Metro, especially back then, of why Marty actually left Kansas City. I was already gone when he So left. you don't know anything? I heard that something at a, at a bar something... Uh, but that's all I it know. was. It was something that involved a potential affair yes. or something like that. I heard that. I heard the same hmm. thing. I never heard that. But I wasn't here. Okay. It was. It was. But I don't want to hear it. Yeah. I mean, honestly, yeah. like I, he know. was. I don't know if it's true or not. Yeah. No, it was you just know? sometimes and it's interesting to I get heard the player yeah, yeah. insight. I heard the same thing. Yeah. Because yeah. when when he left, he left here in ninety nine. He left here in ninety nine. And uh, I got cut right after that and went to Green Bay. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, Gunther Cunningham fired me. Oh, yeah. Gunther. I love Con- I love Gunther. He fired me. I hate him. <laughs> <laughs> Loved him, and then you didn't. What's so weird is that we're talking about all these people who are no longer alive. Yeah. Gunther's gone. Marty's oh, gone. Darren yeah, Thomas is gone. Gunther yeah. died a couple years ago, I think. Does that sound about right? Yeah, I think so. It's been at least a couple of years. Yeah, because hmm. he last time I saw him, he was coaching in Detroit. Yep, yep. Defensive coordinator yeah. over there. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Um, so, anyway. so Ronnie asked you your favorite Chiefs game, and that was the Monday, Monday, Monday night, night Denver, right? Okay. Yeah. So, I don't know if you would say if it wasn't. Was that your favorite NFL game ever, or was there anything better with the Jets? I think you said that was your favorite game ever, wasn't it? Yeah, oh, was favorite, favorite ever. Game. Oh, okay, yeah. okay, okay, okay. Oh yeah, I don't I mean, know if that's Chiefs game. So it was my favorite ever because. When I grew up, I grew up 20 minutes from Oakland. I was a Raiders fan. They oh. moved to 1984. I've hated them ever since. <laughs> and I've hated when they the old, When they went to L.A.? Yeah. Yes. When they went to A. I mean, I love all the ra- older. I, you know, if you ask me about Raiders, I'll tell you about Jim Otto. I'll tell you about Big Ben Damonson. I'll tell you about uh, Kenny Stabler, Cliff Branch. But you ask me about anybody after 84, I don't know. Mm. To me, that's not my team. That's when mm-hmm. they moved them to the Coliseum. Yep, There's a really, I, really good ESPN documentary. Yeah. I think it's, I think, a 30 for 30 mm-hmm. about the Raiders and how Al Davis really just was a man of his own yeah, kind. he was. <laughs> and I hated the, I hated Denver. I hated the Orange Crush, you know, because they got that, they had that mystique, you know, the Orange Crush with all those Edo back, you know, in the 80s when they, would, you know, the Orange Crush and this and that. I hated Denver. And, and so, being able to go there and play there, yeah, 
and beat them. Right. Because mm-hmm. when I was with the Jets, we played there, we lost. And I got to go there Monday Night Football with the legend who I grew up watching, Joe Montana, right. for the Niners, and Marcus Allen and Derek Thomas and Neil Smith and, you know, uh, K- Tim Gronhardt is our center and yeah. Kim Landers and all these guys. And it was just like we beat them and it was just – Yes, I hate mm. Denver. I still hate Denver to this day. Yeah. Unless they ask me to <laughs> coach for them, then it would be a different story. But no. Right, right, right. Yeah, but yeah, it's just, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I don't, I just like them. Okay, so I'd like to do, <laughs> I, I'm 100% on board with you, pal. Um, I'd like you to see, do I'm this. Getting all, like, most of them <clears> yeah, yeah, I love it. Just, the faces. Like I said, if you're, if you're only listening and not watching the video, you should switch. I would the really love to I, I don't hide emotions so, very well. Yeah. Right. So I would like to go through a list of players and then maybe like in one or two, three words, sum up what your first thought is of that person when I mention these people. Okay. Sure. So, um, no sentences. Right. <laughs> right. Just words. Well, yeah, I, I'm trying to like touch on a lot of different people as much yeah. as we can on your opinion of them or feelings of these yeah. people. Yeah. And maybe if it sparks a question, then I'll ask, we will ask a question, but we're at a, an hour and 20 minutes and I want to get to so much more. So, um, I can always come back for podcast 23, we, four, five, six, we, seven, we eight, might have nine. to do that. We keep talking about doing, <laughs> we, we keep talking about doing maybe two parters and just rolling with this. And maybe that's what we'll do with this. We'll see where it goes, but let's start here. Um, Derek Thomas. I love that man. You're getting emotional. Yeah. Was there, uh, was there something that's that, what, what was it that bridged that, that relationship between you two? You wouldn't normally think like a punter and a linebacker or outside linebacker. We had so much fun together. Okay. Um, I, I, I miss him to this day. I know a lot of all those players that played with DT. Um, he and I would play golf together during training camp. He had his um, charities. I'd go do his. He'd go help me with his charities. I'd go help. He'd come help me with my charities. Um, There's no racism between he and I. Mm. You know, like nowadays, there's oh, you know, if you say the wrong word. Mm-hmm. DT and I were brothers. DT was brothers with everybody. There was no color barrier. There was no black, white. We were just teammates. Was that an issue? I mean, with some players? Yeah, there was. You know, even, I know I mean, it's like that. Your last name's Aguiar, yeah, right? So I'm, you're not. I'm, I'm Portuguese. My dad's full blooded Portuguese. My mom is half Mexican, half, my mom's half Mexican, half Aztec Indian. And Span- my mom's, hmm. my mom's dad was full blooded Spaniard. My mom's mom was half Mexican, half Aztec Indian. So, um, you know, I say in Portuguese, everybody goes, well, what's that? Oh, I'm Mexican. Okay, we know what that is. Mm. You know, so I just, you know, mm-hmm. go with the Mexican part. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, DT and I, we never, I mean, you know, there's some players, you know, I, I know there's still today. Um, you know, there's probably, people don't say in the locker room, they watch what they say, but, you know, there's still racism out there with people, and I don't, yeah. I, I, it kills me that there is, and it, we're all one nation. That's why we say we're one nation. We we work together. Yeah. And in the locker room, we were just we were teammates. Yeah. And DT didn't, you know, you know he. I still remember this joke that he talked about. He goes, "Hey, we're playing out in Oakland this week." I'm like, "Yeah." He goes, "Is your mom?" Is, he goes, "Is your mom going to make us uh, chicken fajitas?" I said, "Well, if you go out and spare the chicken, <laughs> we'll have chicken fajitas." He goes, "Well, if I go spare the chicken and you don't make fajitas, he goes, I'm shipping your ass back to Mexico." I said, "Well, <laughs> if." And I go, well, oh DT, God. I go, well, if my mom makes chicken fajitas and you don't get the, uh, you don't spare the chicken for us, I'm going to put you in chains and you're asking to roll back to Africa. Oh, my God. <laughs> so this is me and DT going right, back and forth, right? right? Yeah. Right. We're having a good time. He's talking yeah. about shipping me out, my ass back to Mexico. Your ass got to swim back across the river, the Rio Grande, to get back to Mexico. And I'm talking about, you know. Yeah. And one of the players walks by. I'm not going to mention his name. And he heard me say that, you know, put you in chains and roll you back. What, you racist? And DT looks at him and goes. No, we're having a conversation. We're talking. We're joking. We're teammates. Shut the fuck up. Excuse my language. That's right. And get out of here. Uh-huh. And DT said that to him. Yeah. It was a black guy. Okay. Mm. And he was he was mad at me. And he was all, "You racist." And DT goes, uh-huh. "No. Yeah. Mm. We're talking. Have a good conversation." Yeah. He. That's just how. I mean, right. DT and I were close. You know, we did. 
a lot of things. I brought my, you know, my dog. At the time. I had a, uh, I had a blue healer. Mm. Yeah, great, great, smart dog. Sure. I brought her in the locker room, and I didn't even realize this, you know. And she went, to, and I brought her in because I had to go down for treatment. Uh, and I, and she started barking at. She went to every table and started barking. And DT goes, "Why is she barking?" I'm all, "Hold on, let me see." Oh, I know why she's barking. And she's all, "Why?" I go, "She's never seen a a, a black person before." <laughs> And I'm, I'm being serious. Yeah, for real, yeah. She's never seen one. So she started barking. And DT goes, well, come to my house tonight. My dog's never seen a Mexican, and so I need her to teach her to <laughs> chase Mexicans. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so that's just the way DT and I were. Yeah. Right. You know, right. there was no, there's no race. We're just family. Yeah. yeah. And, and DT and I had so much fun. And I love that. You know, I love that man to this day. You know, I know... His outside was, he did so much for charity, so much for kids, mm. you know, because he didn't have his dad. Mm-hmm. His dad died yeah. in Operation Linebacker. Mm-hmm. And so he wanted to help out all the kids that he could. And I tried to do as much as I could with him. Mm. And he and I became really good friends. We were at training camp. He and I go out drinking together. We'd go play golf together. You know, it was just he and I, you know, and we became really good friends. Mm. And I a lot of that. people don't know that. And a lot of our teammates don't, probably didn't know that either, that how close DT and I were. Mm. But, you know, I just, DT, I love that man. <sighs> how about AD, Anthony Davis? Oh. Smiles. Funny character. Played hard. Yeah. Neil Smith. Hard worker. He was just dyslexic Hmm. and he, yes. And he had to work hard to get past that. And he went back and got his college degree, I I believe. And yes, he's a hard worker. Interesting. He, uh, he came from Nebraska, I believe. Yes, sir. Yeah. And then he went to the Broncos. So were you able to remain friends after that? You see, I mean, he, he, I yeah. occasionally, not so much now that I'm a dad and I don't get out in the yeah, city I mean, as much as I used to in my radio days, but he's still he's still in town. Yeah, he's still in town. I look at, you know, the owners look at it now as a business, so I, I got to look at it as a business. I know, I was joking because you just got done talking about how much you hate the Broncos. Yeah, I would, the only way I could go to the Broncos is if they hired me to be a head coach. Other than that, <laughs> ever, there's no way you're putting a Bronco shirt on this kid. Right. <laughs> um, how about Will Shields? Was uh, worked hard on his craft. Mm. Very good at his craft. Dedicated then. Dedicated, yes. Yeah. Marcus Allen, one of the goats. Okay. I think he was one of the greatest of all time as I, running back. I gotta go, Joe Montana. Goat. Mm-hmm. I think he is the goat. Everybody talks about Brady, but the original goat, Montana. Look what he did. Mm-hmm. How many comebacks he had? Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, yeah, he has four short ball rings. Brady has his rings, but yeah, everybody, everybody compared themselves to Brady. I mean, not to Brady, but to Montana, mm. uh, for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I keep trying to like bring up all these names, but I know some of them were prior. Like I was going to bring up Christian Akoya, but you didn't play with Christian, right? I didn't play him, but yeah. gentle giant. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. I can see that. I can definitely see that. He's a gentle giant. How about Tim Grenhard? Yeah, I was going to bring him up. I hear him all the time on 810. I listen to Sports Radio 810 all the time. <laughs> yeah, he's a chatter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love Tim to death, too. He's Bill Tim, Moss. Bill Moss. He played before me. but Was he? Oh, shoot. Yeah, I thought but, he was during that time, too. No, he, he was done in 80. He was done in 92, I think. Okay. But yeah, same thing. He's just I didn't play with him, but he's a gentle giant also. He goes you see this big guy go down and kneel down and talk to these little kids. It's just yeah. and I saw him play on the field and it was just like dang. You know, because I I played against those guys in ninety ninety one in a preseason game out in, in uh St. Louis in the old Bush Stadium. Okay. So I played against those guys. Hmm. Did you play with Andre Risen then? No, that would have been. Yes, yeah, so I played with really? Spider-Man. Really? You did? Oh, I thought that was after. No, I played with Spider Man. Oh. What do I have to say about that? <laughs> Burn house, left eye. 
<laughs> what? So he, he had a lazy eye? eye? No, no. Left eye. Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. oh, oh, yeah. yeah. Burned his yeah. house down. TLC. Yeah. yeah. Duh. Yeah. Duh. Duh. I, said I knew that. Left eye, burned his house down. I thought you were trying to tell me how a lazy so, eye. So are you no. saying so that was stupid? I was you trying to say it was a joke. No, I, I, my, oh, you knew was, his left eye burned his house down yeah, in yeah, Atlanta, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a joke. But I'm, so you saying that. Andre Ryzen. Okay. True teammate. Really? Hmm. Okay. True teammate. The night that I, the day I got fired with Gunther, I, I got fired. Can't, you know, I went down to a bar in Westport and Andre hmm. Ryzen saw me. He goes, Aggie, come here. I'm all, what? Drinks are on me tonight. I'm all, <laughs> why? He goes, Gunther Cunningham cut you and that's a bunch of BS. You're the best punter out there. I can't believe they cut you. Aww. And he and I sat at the bar and drank all night until closing. No way. Oh. Until like three o'clock in the morning, I said, "You have practice tomorrow." He goes, "I don't care. <laughs> You're here with me, and I bought your drinks tonight. You're my friend. You're my teammate." Hmm. So yeah. So okay. you, was, so you play with Tony Gonzalez then? Yeah. Yeah. Another. Um, I think he's a goat also as yeah. for tight ends. Yeah. That's where everybody compares himself to. Yeah. And he was just, I love his, I loved his mother, I loved his grandmother. Hmm. We, I talked to them, you know, after games with my parents and with him being. Latino also. Mm-hmm. It's just Yeah. Yeah. Got to Had become family. La, yeah. la, la Familia. Mm. Yeah. Family. Mm-hmm. Kimball Anders. So my wife used to actually babysit for Kimball. Oh, really? Yeah. So I got an autographed jersey in the closet that's oh, eventually nice. gonna go up in one of those frames. Um I haven't got them put together Another, yet. Another he's very quiet, soft spoken, but he's a hard player. Mm-hmm. Hard nosed player, do anything. He would do anything for on the field that you ask him to do. Just soft spoken. You, you look at him, he's, he's so soft spoken. You go, this guy playing the NFL? He's just, <laughs> but he's just, yeah, he was good. Uh, we brought him up earlier, Dan Salamuya. Funny. Yeah, he looks like a funny guy. <laughs> he's always got that big smile, too. Yeah, big smile, funny. He just. So what was his nationality? Was he uh, Samoan? Samoan, that's why yep. I figured, yeah. Yep. And so just that, when he come off the side, I mean, such a fierce-looking yeah. competitor, but yeah. when, but Six, he takes that helmet off, he's yeah. got a big old smile yeah. on his face. Yeah, that helmet, I don't even know how it fit on his head. It was so big. Yeah, he's a big dude. Yeah, he was like 6'1", about 330 pounds, and just, he gets just bulldozed his O-lineman. He was good. Who am I missing? I don't know. I looked up a couple of the rosters because I had to like refresh my memory. So that's why when I when I said Andre Ryzen, kind of like a question, yeah, like JJ oh. Burden. Okay, yeah. well JJ, yeah, yeah, I was gonna bring him up because he's the one who scored the touchdown. Flash and uh, okay, it's fast. Mm-hmm. Really? Do you remember what his forty time was? It's probably about a four four. That's pretty good. That's pretty good for back then. Yeah, that's real good back then. Yeah. Hmm. Um. Okay, so let's bring up a couple. Um, uh, old quarterbacks. San Francisco used to be like the. That was. Uh, I don't know if they were like the minor leagues for the Kansas City Chief quarterback program or whatever. Like it the was training just, program. The training program, probably yeah. not minor leagues, but training program. Yeah. yeah. If if there was a quarterback that came out of San Francisco that was available, we would. It was just our guy to pick up. Mm-hmm. So uh, the first person was Steve Bono, if I recall. Oh, so obviously Joe it was Joe. Joe. It was yeah, Joe. But I was. Yeah. We've already talked about Joe. Joe. So I'm saying the next Steve. person would have been Steve. What do you know about Steve? Or what, what, what's the first, you know, summary kind of words that would describe him? Business. Okay. Because hmm. he was, you know, straight arrow guy. Let's get our work done. You know? Um, so there wasn't a lot of connection there. He was just all business. He was, you know, he wanted to win. Okay. You know? Yeah, he was, you know. I, did I play. I, I played golf with Joe. Did I play golf with Steve? No, I really didn't get to know you know know, know him that way. Uh, but Steve wanted you know he knew he had a lot of what's the words I'm looking for. He knew he because um, he was coming behind Montana, mm-hmm. so he had a lot of pressure on him. Big yeah, shoes to fill, a lot of pressure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You hit it right on the nose. Yeah, yeah. He had a lot of pressure on him. You think that that was, I mean, it's not like he wasn't successful. I mean, he went 13 and three one year, didn't he? Yeah, 1995. One of those games was a complete throttling by the Dallas Cowboys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at Dallas, where they lost like 44 to 
three or 10 or something. It was awful. Mm -hmm. Uh, But Steve had some good years. I don't, um, Elvis Gerbach. Overrated. Mm. I mean, I, I got to know Elvis really well. Good guy, good friend. I just think he was overrated quarterback. That's just, yeah. If he sees this, he might get mad, but that's just, yeah. He was, you know, he wanted. Why do you think he was overrated? I mean, what, where did the hype come from? Was it because he came from San Francisco? Yeah, he came from San Francisco. You know, he went to he went to Michigan. Yeah, you know, Michigan true. has you know puts out great quarterbacks. Right. Went to San Francisco, behind Steve Young. You know, mm. supposed to be another great quarterback. You know, sitting behind him, they brought him in because he was a drop back quarterback. But he just, yeah, I, th- I personally think he was overrated. That's just my own opinion. Okay. People may disagree. He might disagree. But friends disagree with each other, right? At times, right. family members do that. I disagree with my three older brothers. Yeah, I disagree. We're, it happens. All right. Wait about who's the who's the best Aguiar son? Is that what you disagree about? Well, who's You're the, the best, best looking? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And has the best arms, right? Yeah. As you, I did have the best arms. Yeah. You don't not not anymore, huh? No. no. All right. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to dive into Louie's live post-football and find out what he's been up to today as we get towards the end of episode 21 of the Papa Ron Podcast. The Papa Ron Podcast is brought to you by Dumar Solutions. Dumar Solutions, offering affordable chemical and PPE solutions for any industry. Automotive, industrial, manufacturing, concrete, and asphalt construction. Also offering kitchen cleaners, corrosion control, and specialty coatings. Detergents, cleaners, and degreasers, laundry care, floor care, odor control, personal hygiene, and much more. Do more with Dumar. Inquire with any of your needs at Dumar Solutions. Dot com. That's D O M A R E Solutions dot com. Now back to the Papa Ron podcast. Here's Ronnie Phillips. I'm having so much fun with this particular episode, being that I'm a big fan of sports ball and in particular the Kansas City Chiefs. I had Mark Boerichter in here. Uh, Oh, Mark reached. Of course, Mark did a lot of stuff with us at Q104, kind of like Mm -hmm. you did back in the day. And um, and he and I have been able to stay in touch over the years. And he came in this summer and did a show, talked a lot about the trade. But and then so that was cool. But there's something about when you're an adult and you get to meet these players. Yeah. And then when you're a kid, and I'm not trying to age you by any means, but I was like back in that day, like, yeah. again, I was, when you came to Kansas City, I would have been like a senior in high school, 94, yeah. Yeah, 94, 94, right? Yeah. So I graduated in 94. So, you know, I'm still relatively a kid, you know, and I'm in yeah. passionate about my team. And yeah. so 30 years later, roughly. I got freaking oh, Louis Aguiar sitting Dang, in that my. That makes me feel old. Yeah, it's Don't just super, super cool, and uh, honored to have you here, man. And, I greatly yeah. appreciate it. And you're, you're talking about you know meeting me now. Um, I still remember the first time I met Joe Montana. Mm. Tell me about that. So I came over from the Jets. I go to mini camp, and I walk in the locker room. <laughs> and I see him. I'm all. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're Joe Montana. Yeah. Oh my God. And he looked at me. Well, so, yeah. And I, right behind him. You're Marcus Allen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm playing with these guys. Right. Well, and I'm you being from- with these guys in the show. <laughs> and I'm going, here's oh, Joe Montana. Oh my I'm God. like, I was just like, like, I was like, yeah. oh my God. I called my parents. I just met Joe Montana. Yeah, that's you know? so cool. And I'm like, you know, it's my fourth year in the NFL. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I'm going, Mom, Dad, I met Joe Montana. That's so cool. In the shower? Yeah. <laughs> I got to see him make it in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> I saw Joe Montana's wiener. <laughs> I saw oh, Marcus Allen. No. Man. I was just, because I grew up watching them. Well, sure. Yeah. And then I get to meet them. Yeah. And like, I was walking along with them well, I'm shaking. I'm like, oh, you're so mad. Oh well, God. especially, I, I would think. I was just like, oh, my God. I yeah. would think that there would have been some. Uh, growing up in California, were you a, U, a USC fan? 
Because well, I grew up, I watched, you know, UC Berkeley. We, you know, I love Cal Berkeley Bears, but they didn't yeah. have anybody big out of there. But yeah, SC. Well, my point I is, lo- is Marcus played yeah, at played. USC yes. and then goes to Oakland. Yep. And then eventually they go to LA. They yeah. win a Super Bowl with LA. Yeah. But my point is, is that you being from that area, like you were a fan of Marcus Allen. Yeah, had I was to have been. Mike, yeah. My cousin played high school football against him. Wow. Mm. In San Diego. Okay. So I knew about Marcus when he was in high school. Because mm. there's this kid over there. He's a quarterback. He plays for Lincoln. Mark Zalian, this kid's just a stud because my cousins played at university. They call it uni. It was a, a private school. Mm-hmm. And he goes, oh, yeah, this kid, Mark Zalian, he's good. So I knew about him in high school. Mm. And he was a quarterback. Yeah. And then he went to SC and they moved him running back. Hmm. So one last question about football before we move on. <clears throat> um, what Were you with the Chiefs when Bo Jackson was playing at the Raiders and playing baseball in Kansas City? No. No. He was, that was 89, 90. Oh, that would have been before. That's yes. right. Oh, was it That's right. that long before? Okay. okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah he I was came, just curious if you had he any. Came, he came out He came out before. He came out of college, I think. He came out of college a year or two before uh, Prime, Coach Prime. Uh, You're talking about Dion? Dion, yeah. Yeah. Because Dion came on. Which I missed that 60 minutes last night. I wanted to to see that he was interviewed on 60 minutes. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. And so he came out. So, yeah, he came out before Dion in 89. And Dion is actually their defense coordinator down there, Dennis Thurman, original. He's another DT. Called me, and I've gone down there and worked with their punters and kickers long time. Jackson, three times. Yeah. Jackson State, twice last year, once this year. I go. Down wow, that's cool. Guys. Yeah, so that's I go really down. Cool. So I, you know, I got to, you know, got Dion's autograph and nice. I played against them, and but yeah, it was. But you don't have any down. memories with Bo Jackson then no, from I playing? Don't. Okay, nope. Okay, right. so can I ask one more sports yeah. ball question? Yes. Yes. Okay, yeah. because but it's going to go baseball. Sure. So I your first baseball. year here was ninety four. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so George Brett was still playing with the Royals. That was his last year, right? Did he retire in 94? Uh, it was either 94 or 95. Yeah, he was already retired. He'd come out to practice. and I He was to... retired? Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. He was I retired. Just wondered... He'd come out to practice. I okay. got to meet him. Yeah. yeah. Well, and you were number five. He was number yeah. five. I thought maybe you guys did some stuff together. Or did, like ever, I don't know. I went up to him when he came out to practice. I said, I said, Mr. Brett, I go, I wore number five because of Pat Leahy that he was number five with okay. the Jets. I come over, I wore number five. I go, I hope I can... Keep this number is in honor as much as you wore number five for uh, the Royals. Yeah. He goes, son, I've seen you play. You'll do just fine. Oh, <laughs> that's so nice. That's I got to know. I got to, and so George would always that's come nice. out to practice because you know him and Marty were friends, and so they used to play golf together. And so they, yeah, he hmm. come out to practice. I got to know him, you know, pretty good. And that, and, and so last year I went to his golf tournament. His and uh, Tom Watson. Mm-hmm. He goes, hey Louie, come here. I need you to meet my friend Tom Watson. I'm all. Okay. <laughs> so you still get starstruck. Yeah. 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 Tom Watson, little short right. guy. Oh, yeah. That's I'm cool. human. Like you said earlier, we're all human. Yeah. Right. We all have our demons. Right. And mm-hmm. I still get stars. You know, you know, somebody with Tom Watson, yes. Mm-hmm. Somebody like John Daly, probably not. Right. <laughs> he's, just one, he's just another guy. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. Tiger Woods, yes. Yeah. Roy McEnroy, probably not. You right. know, it's just... I've never uh, met George I, Brett and I've always wanted to, but then I, but I, but I, but I'm not asking for a negative story. I've just, I've heard negative stories and I thought mm-hmm. maybe I don't want to meet him. Maybe I don't want to ruin. Okay. Well, that's good. Uh, but then again, I'm a guy. Right. So I've never heard any bad ones about him, but yeah, you never, Okay. there might, you know, there might be, you know, I mean, the only stuff I've ever heard is just like him returning down the opportunity to, to sign an autograph for somebody. Is really there, the, yeah. the only thing I've ever heard, but mm. I mean, okay, he signed maybe, for me. You're Louis freaking Aguiar. <laughs> I never, you know, I never think about that. Him signing for you might be a little different than I never little think about little it. Ronnie Phillips coming up and saying, "Mr. Brett, can I, have an I autograph? never, I never, yeah. you know, because I just, I treat everybody. I've never turned down an autograph. Mm. I never. If anybody comes up and asks, yeah, yes, I'll sign anything. We're in the Founders Club yesterday. This little kid comes up. I'm like, yes, I'll sign your autograph. I'm, I was waiting for him to come over and ask me because I get excited yeah. To, yeah. to sign an autograph and talk to this kid who's like 10 years old. And I'm all, what's your name? Oh, my name is Jay. Okay, Jay. Do you play football? Yeah. What position? Oh, I play cornerback. Like, oh, you must be pretty quick. Yeah, I'm pretty quick. <laughs> you know? So I just love 
I, I love that. You know, well, can I have an autograph? I'll give you an autograph. Yeah, I, I want have, something uh, to put in my fan cave. I You've have, seen my fan cave, yeah, right? I have, I, have, I have eight by ten pictures I can give you. That would home. be perfect. I'd love to have something. Yeah. And, and then, of course, I want to make sure that we get a picture. Yeah. Before we leave. All right. So let's unless you have any other. Anything I just want to do you let people put your ring on because we haven't talked about the rings. OK, there you go. Which <gasps> one is that? that? One. Which oh, one's okay. that? That's my ambassador <laughs> ring. OK. Right. And this okay. is a Super Bowl ring that they gave us from anyone that's Chiefs won two years ago. Yeah. And if you notice, I have it on my middle finger. Yeah. So all my family back home are Raider fans. Uh, so you know where I'm going? Yep. The, yeah. If they want the Raider, my family wants to see my Raider ring. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Louie. I go like this, I go here. Do you see my ring? To all my Raider fans. So that's why I got it made and put on my middle finger. That's so funny. For the Raiders. That's a lot of Because I don't like anybody that after heavy. for Raiders. <laughs> that one's heavy. I'll show it to you yeah, like that. I Look at that. I yeah, those my that the Super Bowl ring they gave us is a little bit smaller than the players. Yeah, but really. Yeah, I'm still. They How gave much? us that. That's I was very, 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 very honored. How much money do you think the franchise? Because it wasn't just former players. I mean, anybody who was affiliated with they the sent Chiefs. Out about, but they 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 have different sized rings. Sure, but I mean that's still a significant. You know, they came out. You know, you know all the you know. All the workers in the front office got them. Everybody. Uh, people who work on the grounds crew. Yeah. Uh, you know, they have guys, you know, I still, our, our equipment, our, uh, my uh, trainers who do stuff on game day for them, they gave them one of these, but it, it was, it was like, the size of it was just like about the, the size of it was probably about just the middle of this. So it was yeah. like less than half the size of this. So they okay. gave out. And then the girls got necklaces, right? Cause, yes. Because. Because Susie, I know Susie, she's one of my bosses in one yeah. of my part-time jobs that rode war paint, right. got a necklace right. oh, cool. instead. They, they spent cool. like it was over, a lot. They spent almost two million dollars on rings for the wow. people, for the Chiefs organization. I heard it was like close to seven hundred rings they gave out. That's incredible. But they go from wow. the players' rings, the front office. Everybody who worked in the front office got the same ring as the players, the big oh, ones. Oh wow! wow. Yes. Uh, those are worth over thirty thousand. Wow! Yes, <laughs> can't <even> fathom. <laughs> right, yeah. I know. Just a uh, just a ring. It was like, oh my god, you know, because there's are there's are all diamonds and rubies. You know, the KC here. Yeah, those rubies. These little red right here. It's all rubies. Mm. Well, mine's aren't rubies. Yeah. Oh. So. Well, I didn't know. Yeah, but yeah, it's so, still cool. It's still beautiful. Yeah, so they it's give us heavy. this, and I work. And I only wear it when I go to like Chief games. Or I coach high school football. Or you or come on the Papa Ron podcast. <laughs> or, yeah. Have you done a lot of these before? Podcast? I mean. I've done a few of them. Yeah. 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 You know, people I've known said, you know, I coach high school football and the things I say. And they go, you should have a podcast. You should have a camera follow you. You say things. I go, yeah, I say things. That's why I want them divorced twice because they always said I need a rewind button or an edit button. So uh, <laughs> a mute button. Yeah. A mute button. That's probably <laughs> what. I need a mute, a mute button. I'm Eight like, second yeah, delay right. like the old radio. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So let's move past football because I'd like to try to keep this. Um, <clears throat> that ain't going to happen. I was going to try no. to keep it under two hours, but there's no, no way it's going to happen. happen. So um, post football, like what point do you realize, okay, um, I'm not wanted anymore, basically, because that's kind of what it comes down to, right? Like you want to keep playing as long as you can play, but mm -hmm. you can only play as long as you're wanted. Correct. And at some point you realize that the teams just, they're moving on. They want somebody else other than you. Right. So what does that transition of life look like for you? It was not easy because in most professions, not sports usually you get to retire on your terms but in sports a lot of players you know like we're talking about george brett you know he got to retire on his terms because right. he played a long time he's a legend he's mm -hmm. a goat yeah mm -hmm. um joe montana got to retire on his own but a lot of players like myself who i got lucky enough to play 10 years and then which is huge yes i'm I saw a thing that the NFL put out, and only two two percent of all NFL players played ten seasons or more. Oh so wow! So I'm, I'm one of two percent. Wow. So and I'm like, wow, you know. Um, and you weren't taken out with injury. Correct. I mean that. that I was would taken be... out because I they a lot of teams are too old or um, salary cap. Mm -hmm. 
you know, because oh. they salary cap came in. So to pay me, it was the next amount of dollars. And then to pay, I think it was like 500,000, but then they could get a rookie punter mm-hmm. for like 200 and that extra 300 they save, they can give that to a sign most to a receiver or sure. or somebody else. Sure. Yeah. So that's, I kept, I was 35 years old. My last year in the NFL, uh, 2000, uh, I tried for the next five years until I was 40. Cause I knew I was, I'd gone punt. I was putter and punt by a lot of these kids, but, too old in the salary cap. So yeah. finally at 40, I made my last tape uh, of tape or DVD sent out to the teams. And some of the teams go, Oh, we didn't know you're still playing. They go, we'll put you on our list. Uh, if, if we need somebody, I'm okay. Well, no, that year when I was 40, no one, no punters got injured and no one got fired. And after that, I'm okay. Get my last shot. And I sent my retirement. Papers so I have a in. question about that right now, <clears throat> or uh, about that rather. Um, you're basically talking about your minimum salary that you can take as a tenured, correct, tenured person in the league. I want if I could take two hundred thousand, I would have. Took That's my question. Did, could you not no, negotiate and say, "Look, no. you know, I want to keep playing, no. and that I've got the, to- that was through the the, C, the CBA collective bargaining agreement, and they had to pay us an X amount of dollars. Hmm. So, which I, is probably something the players' union negotiated, but in, in a way, it kind of screwed you in the end. Correct. Yeah, because I couldn't take any less money. So I could go up to CFL and make, you know, 50000 if I wanted to because they didn't, they didn't pay much. I actually got called by one of the teams to come up there to go play for them to punt and kick because uh, their guy wasn't doing well. Then they ended up getting a – they ended up getting a – because I was non-Canadian, so mm. they only allowed so many non-Canadians on their team. Oh, okay. Like ten or eleven or something like that. And I, I don't. I don't want. To, and so, if I would have went up there, they would have had to get rid of cut somebody, cut somebody, and they didn't want to do that. Yeah. Okay, not a problem. Yeah. I said I'll come out and play for you. So they called me. I talked to the GM a couple of days, and they were talking about bringing me in, and mm-hmm. and then they said they couldn't do it because they somebody got hurt and they needed to you know bring another American in. I'm okay, not a problem because it's it's different up there. They only allowed so many Americans on the team. Hmm. So let me ask this. You're obviously a professional athlete. We're talking two hundred to five hundred thousand dollars a year, right? That's minimum. Minimum. Like, Back then, <clears throat> well, my minimum when I was playing, uh, my last year it was it was my second last year was our minimum was two hundred. Okay, what was what was your biggest my last co- year was four fifty, but I only played ten games, so I get ten seventeenths of four fifty, mm-hmm. but then. Okay, I'll just say say three hundred thousand. I don't sure. know what it is. After tax, the f- straight taxes right alone, you get that cut in half. Mm. So I'm down to one fifty. You're in a different tax bracket, for right? Sure. Different tax bracket, one fifty. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then I lived in Reno, Nevada, so I have to rent an apartment. Mm. You know, for that ten weeks, the only thing I could find at the time was you know two thousand a month. Mm. You know, and I did that for ten weeks, so that was three months. Yeah. Okay. Then pay that, and then I also had my mortgage back right. home. You know, so all out of out of one fifty, right off the bat, it's like that dropped down to a hundred. You know, with the bill. You know. Right. So yeah, it's just that's that was one particular season. Yeah. What was your biggest contract? That was it. Okay. Minimum salary because it got bumped up. Yeah. So you always had the minimum. Basically, yeah. Did you? That's the chief. I got a little bit more than minimum when I was with the Chiefs. I actually turned down. I actually turned down more money. Like I, earlier, I think I talked about. Yeah. I turned down more money to go to Miami or Philadelphia because I wanted to go win the Super Bowl. Right. You so, said that off the air when we were oh, okay. getting so, set up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I. Yeah. I talked about that. So I took a little less money. It was still above minimum. I think minimum at the time was two hundred. So I think I got like two twenty five. And so I, I didn't get. You know, when I was my biggest contract with the Chiefs, I was only making two fifty. Wow. Mm. So you cut that. It's a whole different, taxes. it's completely different today. Like, oh, I mean, oh, yeah. 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 You know, I, the rookie, the punter that's playing for him right now, I bet right now his minimum, since he's a third year player, I think it's close to like, a million. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So mm. even though that's a completely different time in the league um, and it's not, it's not still not bad money. Like, no. I mean, for compared to right. average people, like, Oh, it was great Us? money back then. Right. But 
so what, I guess where I'm ultimately going is your transition from making anywhere from two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars a year to, to now you're, you got to go make it on your own doing something else. What do you yep. What do you do? Yep, the first couple of years, uh, I started my own kicking camps in two thousand two. Two thousand two, I started doing my own kicking camps, and I did ten camps a summer throughout the United States, and I also did a pro camp where I'd get anywhere from fifty to hundred kids that were out of college who wanted, who wanted to try and make it in, into the NFL. There's only 32 punters and there's only 32 kickers. And I would have, you know, at my camp, I would have 50 punters and I had 50 kickers. So we had 100 kids. Out of those 50 kids, you know, maybe 10 of them get to go to training camp. And out of those 10, uh, you know, maybe one makes a team. Mm. So, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's not easy. Um. So I did that for the, I did that and then I did that. And then I worked construction. I, cause I grew up working construction back home, did construction up and this is a, I'm going to from 2000 when I, my last year was 2000 up until 2013. I'll talk about real right now. So, and I got divorced and then I met another gal, moved out here in 2002, worked construction, I uh, started my own kicking camps in 2002. Started your own what? Kicking camps. Kick, hunting, oh, kicking hunting, camps. Okay. Kicking, long snapping camps. Yeah. And when you say working construction, does this mean that you're owning a construction company no, or you're no. actually doing the physical labor? Yeah. A buddy of mine owned one in, in uh, where, I, where I moved to. Okay. Yeah. I actually, you know, I wore a belt. I had a hammer. I had a nail gun. Oh, yeah. Tape measure, pencil. Hard yeah. hat. He didn't Come wear the hard hat. Now. He wasn't OSHA Louis. approved. Well, I wasn't OSHA approved. <laughs> <Louis>. <laughs> I just say, no, Blake, listen, you're. Oh, my God. Stop it. <laughs> Louis, was <laughs> that? No, Blake, listen, you're. Was that? Was then that? they start speaking Spanish to me, and I'm all, what'd you say? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I'm out there building houses. Yeah. Was that, was that, um, I don't know how to ask this. I mean, I would think that that would be humbling. Very. You, you, you're, you're a professional athlete making great money. You're not making millions, but still a professional athlete making two, three hundred thousand dollars a year. Yeah. And now, in order to live a certain lifestyle, you got to swing a hammer. Yeah. And but I, I love doing that. I still do that to this day. Really? Okay. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not trying to pass judgment. I'm just saying I would think that for somebody who came after ten years of living a high profile life to going back to doing manual labor, that would be a culture shock. Hmm. No, I would do that on the, on the, on the, my, my oldest brother was a PE teacher. My number two brother was a mortgage, bro, a mortgage broker. Is that what they sure. call Sure. Yeah, I think so. He does mortgages. Yeah. Reverse <laughs> mortgages. Okay. Yeah. He gives, gives people yeah, and money. Then my number three brother owns his own uh, construction and roofing business. So I would come home after, you know, on the off season, I lived in Reno about three hours from my parents. So I drive down to my parents' house. And my brother needed help on a job. Yeah, I would go out and uh, swing. I'd put my belt on and go swing hammer and help build a house or put a roof on or take you know take the shingles off and put the shingles on and build walls and put them on sixteen inch centers and make sure the room square and. So it was humbling, but maybe not to the level of which I would have. I was thinking what a lot was. of people. Yeah. What a lot of people. What a lot of athletes are used to. Yes. Mm-hmm. Because I would, on the off season, I would work with Ray Pelfrey. Then I'd go down and see my parents. And then my brother has a construction company or roofing. He owns both. So I'd go down and help him. And I, my dad at the time, uh, he retired in 1996. Uh, he started a handyman business. So I'd go down and help him too. Okay. So, yeah, I, yeah, I was, my parents kept me very humble when I was playing. I, I did all that, that stuff. <clears throat> And that's just where I was born and raised. And I, yeah. So you go ahead, Joe. So that wasn't, it wasn't difficult for you. Like, like to, to go from, like I said, the lifestyle he's saying to then going and work, having to work all the time and do manual labor. It wasn't, that that's wasn't a struggle. I, that's where I grew up. I yeah. mean, I grew up doing work in construction and building, you know, help my yeah. dad go to our friend's house and uh, put up a barn, yeah. a metal barn. I did that in college, you know? Okay. Remember, finish, finish this sentence. Measure twice. Cut once. Okay. I measure I, about I believe four it. times. Did you? Four times? Yeah, I measure because I want to make sure. I don't <laughs> right. want to waste wood. Right. I don't want to mess right. up the cut. I right. measure. I go back and measure. 
you know, I go, I, I measure this part twice. I go measure the wood. Yeah. Well, let me just make sure. I want to make sure I'm not a uh, 16th off. Yeah. You know, because I don't want anything to yeah. wobble. So, so I, I didn't, go back and measure again. Okay, measure. Okay, I cut it. Oh, I yeah. didn't grow up as a handyman by any means, but I did with the help of my brother-in-law frame this basement. This so I learned a little bit about that yeah, the hard way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. when the price of wood a couple of years was... <laughs> Yeah, you didn't want to make any of those mistakes. Mm-mm. So the no. work the work wasn't hard. Was no. there a struggle in letting go of letting go of the football part of it? Yes, that was the hardest part. It was the part. letting go. Talk about that. That was the hardest part. Um because what is it? It's I, I would imagine I'm gonna speculate here because I talk to people who are in the military who struggle with PTSD. And mm-hmm. the PTSD doesn't necessarily come from the traumatic events that they experienced in war as much as it was the um, the reassociation to coming back from overseas, leaving the brotherhood, leaving the team. Mm-hmm. In this case, you would be leaving a football team. They're leaving their boys, their unit, their brothers, and they're mm-hmm. coming back to civilian life. And the and the trauma is not necessarily the the gritty stuff that they saw. It was being a civilian and not really knowing how to function in civilian life. That's tough to do. Hmm. You're used to. You know, I changed my own oil. When I was playing, I would I was in the Arrowhead parking lot, changing my brakes and changing really? my oil. Really? <laughs> but you were the only one on the team doing that. I bet. yeah. But you know, when it got cold, I'd go to Jiffy Lube. Right. You know. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd go to Jiffy Lube. Oh, hi, I'm Louis Aguirre. Oh, we'll do your oil for free. I'm all. Oh. This is pretty cool. Yeah. Hold on but a then second. now, when you're like you said, civilian life. You don't get those perks. Yeah. Right. You don't, you call a restaurant, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, we can get you in. You don't have that perks anymore as a player. Mm-hmm. I mean, just little things like that that you took for granted. Yeah. You got free clothes. You got free shoes. I mean, it's just. Which is so weird. You're making all of this money, which you can afford it more ever right. than and now. Yeah. But they're still giving it to you for free. Yeah. You know, I had a Nike shoe contract. Wow. You know, so I would. Get my cleats for free. I would get an X amount of dollars to spend on my family. You know, I'd I'd buy my family. You know, they every year they knew they were getting Nike gifts for Christmas, whether it be <laughs> shoes, sweats, whatever. Sure. I go, what do you guys want from Nike? I'll get it for you. Yeah. I go, you know, I have Nike shoe contract. So my family, you know, or my and my ex wife, they would get stuff for their families. You know, mm-hmm. when I was married, they get stuff for their. Mm-hmm. So we got, you know, I'm, I was used to getting, you know, perks. Um. Having a structured day. Yeah, because the team has already got an itinerary set out yes, for you. you. You know what you're doing every day. You, you become on your own. You're like, okay, I get up and eat breakfast. Now what do I do? Mm. I don't have anybody tell me what to do. Mm-hmm. Well, I had an ex- I had a wife tell me what to do, but <laughs> <laughs> honey, don't, do this. Don't we all? <laughs> but no, I was so used to having a structured day. Yeah, I've been like that ever since I can remember, you know, going to school and I started playing sports at age six years old. Mm-hmm. And now I played six sports for 30 years from age six to age 35. And now it's like, it's taken away from you. I'm all like, now what do I do? So, so what did you do? It was not easy. What did you do? And what, <clears throat> let's, I, like, let's get it. Let's like get said, beneath I, the I, surface I a little in, bit. I went in, uh, <clears throat> I went in to start Keep my kicking camps, mm-hmm. punting, kicking, long snapping. A buddy of mine who I played up in Green Bay with, Craig Heimberger, he had a construction company, so I worked construction with him. Mm-hmm. For, not with him, for him. He was the owner. I was a laborer. Mm-hmm. I worked for him, building houses. Um, And then at age 42, I got my, fi- I finished college and got my degree. Oh. So that was in 2009, I think. Yeah, 2008, because I was born in 66. So that would mm-hmm. make me tw- uh, 2008, okay. get my degree. Okay. 2009, I started substitute, substitute teaching over in the Fox School District over in, on the south side of downtown St. Louis, about 20 minutes away. Okay. Next year, I started Teaching and coaching high school football over there, I taught credit recovery. The kids that get kicked out of school Mm -hmm. that have problems. Mm -hmm. I never had a problem with the kids. I love those kids. I had so much fun with them. Yeah. You know, our kids and, uh, you know, all the teachers in normal school, 
normal school, uh, you know, say Fox High School or Sacramento High School. Oh, you got the bad kids. No. Mm. I have two to seven kids per class, so I got to be one-on-one. When those kids were in a class of like 30, yeah, they would yeah. screw around and they were considered the bad kids, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I never had a problem with them. I did that for three years, two and a, two and a half years. So I taught, I went back, I coached football at Sacramento High School, and I taught credit recovery. I did PE and health for there. And then I did that for two and a half years, and then I got to go, Rex Ryan called me, and I went and go coach with the New York Jets in 2013 and 14. Rex Ryan, who uh, yes. who's now on, on ESPN yes. NFL Countdown. Oh, I, yeah, crazy Rex. I love Rex to death. He is crazy. Yes, he's funny as, he's funny as anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you know his dad i got no i did not i got to, which would be buddy ryan who yep. used to be uh, a defensive coordinator for the giants under bill parcells and then eventually head coach of the philadelphia eagles but he was also the d coordinator when they won the super bowl in 85 the 85 bills with, with the, bowl, the giants the, no the with the uh both chicago bears that's right, Ditka. That's yeah, right. He was Ditka. the he was the oh. defensive coordinator with Ditka, Ditka yeah. in '85. You're yeah, right. They ran the '46 defense. So maybe he wasn't with the Giants, and I've got that confused with the Bears. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know if he ever coached the. Giants. Yeah, I could be wrong. I could be wrong with that one. But you are right. He was defensive coordinator at the Bears before he took over Philadelphia head coach. Right. Anyway, so there. but Rex's dad was Buddy Ryan. Did, right. did you ever know him? I I never knew him. Okay. I got to meet him uh, when I was coaching with Rex. Okay. Uh, I was playing with the Jets in 91 when he got in a fight with Gilbride <laughs> on the sidelines. Yeah, I remember mm. that. Oh, you remember that? Oh, yeah. 1991. Oof, that was ugly. Yeah. And we're on it our side. It was just crazy line. seeing an old man just wanting to throw haymakers. I mean, because oh, yeah. he was an older guy. Yeah. At the time. Yeah, because we were on our sidelines and we're all talking. We saw a fight over there. We have we have no idea what's going on. We Next thing you know, we see the whole... Uh, Houston. Uh, That's right. He was with the, the Houston Oilers. Mm-hmm. Their team. Next thing you know, you see all the players go into a big circle. We're going, what yeah. the hell's going on? Yeah. Hmm. And so then after the game, I talked to Reggie Roby, who was their punter at the time. He goes, "Oh, uh, 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 Ryan, Buddy, uh, Buddy Ryan, Buddy Ryan, and Gilbert got in a fight. We're all <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, they got they got a, they got an argument, and uh, Buddy didn't like it, and." They got in a fight. I'm okay. Then I see that. Then we fly. We lost that night. We lost the Oilers that night. Then we go home. And I saw it on ESPN because they actually had it on ESPN. Yeah, of course. Oh, yeah. You see, buddy, you know, buddy throw a haymaker. Older, yeah. yeah. He, throw, he was already in his 60s at the time because when I met him, and I met him in 2014, and he was in his 90s. Yeah. So he was probably in his 60s. Sure. And he, they showed on ESPN where he's throwing haymakers at mm-hmm. Gilbride. Next, mm-hmm. you know, it's just oh yeah. And I, when I met Buddy, I asked him about Gilbride's the head coach, right? Yeah, he was the, the offense, Houston he was Oilers offense coordinator. Oh, he was. I was trying to explain it for Jill because I'm sure Jill has no yeah. idea who we're talking about okay. here. Mm-hmm. Buddy Ryan was D coordinator. Mm-hmm. Uh, Scott uh, Scott Gilbride. Gilbride. I remember the last name was Gilbride. I he thought... was the Wade Phillips was the head coach. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. Wade, okay. Uh, not Wade Bum Phillips. Oh, his dad. No, that ain't right either. No, Wade Phillips was. Wade Phillips was the. I could Google it if you want. Yeah, yeah Google it. <laughs> hey, I actually I go. Wade Phillips. Actually, go on to YouTube and then uh, yeah, YouTube look up it. that the. Um, oh, that's a good idea. YouTube Buddy, Buddy Ryan, Ryan fight or Ryan online fight. sideline yeah. fight. Anyway, because I can't remember who the head coach was. Yeah. I know it, it really it doesn't matter. It was a well, yeah, Ethel well, Hellmakers. We're we're going way off. No, what was that question? You were talking about Rex Ryan. Yeah, I got, so, I got a job with Rex. I coached there for thirteen and fourteen, okay. and then our we go eight and eight. My first year there, they kept us on staff. Next year we go four and twelve. Yeah, and we all all get let go. Yeah, Rex gets a head coaching job up in Buffalo. Mm-hmm. He said he was going to bring bring me with him. He did it. The first year. And the second year, after the second year, he goes, hey, I want to bring you in next year. I said, okay. Well, after the second year, they all got fired again. Fired, yeah. So then it's not what you know, it's who you know. Yeah. So I've been try- I try to get back in the NFL from 2015 until about 2020. I gave up. I went to work for Tough Shit, uh, probably. But I gave up about tw- in 2020, but I was still sending out resumes but i was you know working so i worked at i started working for tough shed mm-hmm. selling tough sheds okay. that they have uh for the tough shed company not for the ones that they sell at home depot 
So I did that for about six months, sitting behind a desk. I couldn't do that. So mm -hmm. then I went, so in 2016, I went to go work for Tiger Plumbing. 16, 17, right around there. Uh, yeah, because uh, this would be in 2019, I got injured, and I've been on uh, workers' comp ever since. I've had two back surgeries. Oh, wow. Mm. Uh, I was carrying carrying concrete because I could do, they found out, because I, like I said, I did, con uh, I used to work construction. Mm -hmm. I've done concrete work. Mm hmm uh, I didn't know much about plumbing, so I said, I'll go look work for, you know, I saw an opening, I was thought, I'll go work for a plumbing company, because I like to, you know, get dirty and get underneath and build stuff, and mm -hmm. yeah. that's the kind of type of person I am, and then they found out I, I could do finished concrete, so after, like, in a basement, you know, you cut the concrete out, you dig the rock out, you dig the dirt out, then you get to the... Uh, the, the, the sewer line, you know, whether it be the old galvanized or the old clay that collapsed or mm -hmm. galvanized would, you know, uh, get rust and rust clothes. So we'd have to cut that out, put that in, put mm -hmm. a new piece in, clean that all out. Then we'd put the dirt back and then the rock. And then I would come in and I'd carry about 20 bags of 50 pound rock mm -hmm. from, you know, from my van down in the basement. Mm -hmm. You know, so I have to carry it in the front door, go down the steps, bring it down here cut it then i'd do that with uh anywhere from 20 to 40 bags of concrete 80 pound bags mm. so i was carrying them and I, I go hey i asked my uh manager at the time i said hey i need some help i go these bags are heavy he goes well you're the strongest guy we got here i said i know i'm I, i'm 50 years old yeah but you're the strongest guy i said i know i understand that i work mm -hmm. out okay but i need a young kid to help me tear it because if not my back's gonna go out yeah so a year later, because I was, you know, doing the, you know, underneath houses, you know, going in the crawl spaces and fixing drains and having sewer on, you know, you cut a sewer and you get sewer ah, on you. No, no, and no, you no, fix no. it. I mean, I, you're fixing things. You get done, you look at it and go, damn, that looks cool. That's yeah. right. Yeah. I, I did, I did my that. job, yeah. you yeah. know. Yeah. The, the satisfaction. Yeah. yeah. I love that stuff. Okay. Good. Uh, you know, just like coaching, you know, the kid does it right. I love the satisfaction. Sure. I co I've been coaching high school. I coach high school football. I work with the punters and kickers, long snappers. The satisfaction. So fast forward, I was carrying concrete. Both my legs are going numb. I went, got uh, injured in my back, and I had five bulging discs, and I had to have my mm. back. Uh, and the nerves were got cut off because <sighs> of the because of my back because mm -hmm. the uh, the bulging disc got cut off. The nerves going down my legs, so I had a fusion done. On my L three four five, didn't take. A year and a half later, they had to go in there again, mm. and with titanium cages. Oh my gosh! Uh, take out the disc and put those in. And at the time when they did the first fusion, I had two rods put in my back by yay long, and then I have six screws. And then the first fusion t didn't take hold on the uh, on my spine. So then, then a year later, they had, they mm. went in through my belly to take the disc out but since i had cancer the radiation uh, uh the radiation on my in my uh belly and my inside area it scarred the tissue so they couldn't get past it oh no so they had to glue staple me back together that was on a friday then on monday they went in through my back and they could get the disc out they said if they did they were gonna have to go in through the side so then they oh, go gosh. in and i they took the disc out and put two titanium discs in between my L3, L4. So here's L3, L4, put a disc here, put one here, titanium disc with bone marrow. Those are growing. So it's been since October 5th of 2020, and I still struggle doing things. Yeah. If I try to lift something over 25, 30 pounds, you feel my back it. starts hurting. Yeah, I start. I can't, <clears throat> you know, bending over. I try to bend over, pick up my laundry, walk downstairs. My back starts, the, everything around mm. my back starts hurting. Dang. Um, if I stand upright and walk, I can go for a walk for about 30 minute walk and then start hurting. I come home, I lay on the floor, put my feet up on the couch, like right here. I don't know if you guys mm. have noticed. I, I kind of keep switching spots because yeah. my mm -hmm. back. Yeah. Um, also, I, these chairs are. Well, I drive <laughs> not very comfortable. I drive, I, you know, like I drive from <laughs> St. Louis to here. <laughs> Uh, from St. Louis to here, I got to stop a couple of times because stretch, stretch out. Yeah. yeah. Stretch my, my, uh, right leg 
one of my legs will uh, start. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Or, cramp. Or, yeah, it will cramp yeah, up okay. or start going numb. So I yeah. got to get out every hmm. couple hours, about every couple hours, about okay. every two hours. So I got to get out and walk around because it starts going numb or um, I start cramping. Yeah. Start having pain going down my back to my SI joints and down my legs. So I got to get out and walk and, hmm. oh, yeah. But every couple hours, so I can't, so I'm look. Uh, I, yeah. Well, we're at 214 now, so you're probably going to feel the need here to start stretching, I would imagine. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I, I, we'll, we'll yeah, try I to get, working, yeah. we'll try to put a wrap on this, but I guess where um, I wanted to ultimately get was the emotional state of living a certain lifestyle that you were at playing professional football. You know, another thing that we need to cover too was you mentioned cancer. We haven't hit on that at all. Uh, I didn't even know until prior to this, we started recording that you even had cancer. Jill probably knew that. I mm-hmm. didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe start there. What, what, what's the story with the cancer? And then if you would, everyone knows this is a humanity podcast. You had opened up to Jill about some things that you had struggled with in the transition of life and everything that you've been yeah. through that you've never really spoke publicly about. And to whatever level you're comfortable speaking about it for the first time on this show, um, I know from telling my story, it's been impactful in helping others, and maybe your story could do the same. So I'd love for you to share whatever you're comfortable with sharing about that, but let's start with cancer. Uh, yeah, I had testicular cancer. Uh, uh, I found it. Were, were, I got operated on March 4th of 98. It was a Wednesday. Prior Two weeks prior to that, uh, in February, uh, my ex-wife and I uh, were, going on, were going out to Hawaii, to go on vacation. But before that I was, we, I had five acres, I had a nice house. So we had a septic tank. So I was building, I was digging a hole so I could put a square box Mm -hmm. three feet high. So I could get to the uh, clean out for the septic tank. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So I got, I went to the store and bought two by 12s pressure treated, made the box four foot by four foot. You know, made sure it's square. I used four, four by fours in the corners. I got galvanized uh, uh, three inch screws. You know, made the box, made sure it's square and all that. I was digging the hole. It's kind of hard to put a square box in a round hole. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that's what they say. <laughs> so I'm digging this hole and it's round. I'm yeah. all. I got to lift the box up. I, you know, I could lift the box at the time, and those weren't light. At the, you know, no. that's not yeah. light. Yeah. You know, because I had two by twelve. I had two by twelve. Yeah, two by twelve. That's twelve inches. So I had four of those down, all the way around. So I yeah. had four foot. I had four foot, all the way around. Right. Two by twelve and four by fours in the corners. Right. And I lifted that thing up by myself to put it in the put it in the hole. Well, what happened was, square box round hole. So I I grabbed my uh, pick handle. You know, I have all these little tools. I'm tool the Tim the Toolman Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> so I started picking oh. it right. Yeah. So I was picking the corners, you know, with this nice pick handle. Doing Sorry, the corners. but her sound effect just. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go Gotta ahead. Gotta do it. Right on in. <laughs> we could. <laughs> so, and then I got to the, I, I was building the corner. I got the top half done, but then I had to dig down. So I put the pick handle between my leg. Oh. So I had the, my left hand behind my, behind, I had the left hand behind me. I had my right hand going like this, you know, just picking uh-huh. a little bit down uh-huh. here. Uh-huh. Well, I went to go like this. I hit the top lip. The handle came up and, Ugh. yeah, it hit me right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It hit me in the testicle. And so I went inside. I wasn't so much pain. I went and I'm iced having it. pain in that region right yes. now, just visualizing that. I went and iced it. And a week later, we go on vacation and I'm still feeling my, and I felt like there's a little bump, you know, on the backside. So I was checking it and I checked it and bump got a little bigger. While I was on vacation in Hawaii. Hmm. We came, uh, we came home on a Sunday, my ex-wife and I, Krista, came home on a Monday, uh, Sunday, called a urologist on Monday. He looked at it. He goes, well, I need you to go get a blood test, a urine test, and an ultrasound. So that day on Monday, I went to get the blood test and urine test. Next morning, I had to go get an ultrasound, and I had to go to a breast center. Mm. Okay, so I'm, in the, I'm out there in the waiting room. With all these ladies getting their, right, mm-hmm. right, getting right. the, because that's the only thing they had back then, right? You know, to get an ultrasound. Right. So I go in there and they go call my name and we have to ultrasound your testicle. I'm okay. Pull your pants down. I'm okay. And this young gal comes in. 
puts the gel on. I said, can you go get the oldest, ugliest lady out there? Please? Oh, my gosh. Stop it. I knew there really? was something. <laughs> I don't want to embarrass both of us. <laughs> oh, you want to get that warm right. gel and the thing, you know what they do. Right. Okay. You know, the ultrasound for your babies? Remember, we're on video. Yes. He, he's, he's trying. I'm trying I know. My- well, I they, know. They had to do that on, on his I understand. I yes. understand what body part we're doing. <laughs> That's what I'm so now, like, if you're doing it, yes. Yeah, can you go get somebody else to do this? An oldest, right. ugliest lady? Right. This old mm-hmm. 65-year-old lady, not the tiny. I was 29. Mm-hmm. No, no, it's 32. Comes in. What do you want? I'm, oh. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so you, you don't have to worry about that down. sort of stimulation. Yes, yeah. So I got to, I finally got to ultrasound down. Didn't embarrass anybody. Okay. I felt good about that. <laughs> <laughs> that was on Tuesday. On Wednesday, I was on the operating table. Wow. Oh, my they had, gosh. They told me I had cancer. What stage were you at, or did they know? They caught it early enough. Okay, good. That I had to, I didn't have to do chemo. I had to do radiation. Okay. Went down my chest here. Then They called it a hockey stick. Went down here, then went to the left. Hmm. And that's why when they went in and cut in me to go do my yeah. back, it was all scarred, scarred up. up. All the, so they, yeah, so they cut mm-hmm. here. And so they, told they take it out and they cut it and yeah so the you basically racking yourself with a pick saved my saved yeah. your life yes yeah that is nuts <laughs> see what i did there <laughs> completely oh, all these dad uh, listen, jokes here we go sorry here we go. i even did that on accident um Oh, it is had, crazy. Uh, peanut M and M's over here. Uh, here's uh, an almond, <laughs> almond something. I do have uh, some peanuts oh, actually. Joy. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes I feel like a nut. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes I don't. Oh my god. Okay. Oh, that's, man, <laughs> that's, that's like the third dad joke. Yeah, let's see okay. Like so the pick you Ding. picked yourself in the yes, in the, I, in I, the I, scrotum picking, yeah. and it saved your life. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. yeah. And then I go. There to, you go. Okay. So I that was more. I got operated March fourth of ninety eight. So the Chiefs didn't know I was going to come back or not. I ended up coming back, and I had the High Five Foundation. The next year, they cut me in 99. Wow. I go up to Green Bay, uh, and the punter up there, uh, um, I'm not going to be able to help you with this one. Jo- uh, Josh, he was a fourth-round draft pick for him. He had, testicular. they found out, he had testicular cancer no in training way. camp. Yeah. So, he found he out to stickler. He was a rookie, so he didn't have any insurance. Oh my! So you know, a lot of players got the money and gave him money. So he had testicular cancer. I went up there and replaced him, and I had testicular cancer the year before. Wow! So yeah, that was. Were you any kind of mentor to him through all any of that? I never got. To, I never didn't got meet to him. And, I didn't meet him until uh, uh, I talked to him on the phone once. Uh, Lance Armstrong also reached out to him. Lance didn't reach out to me. I went, come on, man. <laughs> I had it first. Josh yeah. Bidwell? Yes, that's it. Okay. Thanks, Google. Yes, <laughs> Josh Bidwell. He he was drafted. He came from University of Oregon, fourth round draft pick. I believe was, you. I, didn't, I don't know. Google. I already closed it. I, you know, I can remember those, yeah. some of those old yeah. things. You have a good memory. If you ask me what I did yesterday... At the Chiefs game, we lost. Yeah, I mean, I that too. yeah, that was tough. Even okay, with, so, um, so I had the testicular cancer. Yeah, uh, one played, and then I started the High Five Foundation here in Kansas City, raised money, and we donated. My first year, I did it in '98. We raised like thirty-five, forty thousand. I gave to, to I gave to uh, Cancer Action and El Centro Mexican community. I gave it to the uh, Hispanic community mm. and I did that also in 99, uh, gave about 50,000 split it between them. And then, uh, in 2000, I was in Chicago and didn't have, and didn't, we didn't, I didn't do anymore. Cause in the 98, I played here 99. We saw a lot of, uh, investors, you know, help. Yeah. Cause I said, I'd donate a hundred dollars for every pun inside the 20. So a lot of doctors, a lot of people said, I will match you. So they did oh, that nice. two years in a row. Yeah. Then when I went to Chicago, I got picked up like week seven. So yeah. I didn't do anything that year, but I, yeah. Yeah. But I still come back and do a lot of the, even though I was in Chicago, I flew back here for a couple of uh, charity events, even though I was, you know, I fly back Monday night, play, do the charity golf tournament, then fly back there. Mm-hmm. So it was, I could do that. Yeah. Why did you pick St. Louis, the, or at least the suburb of St. Louis, to be Second a resident? wife Okay. <laughs> I can let, I can, you know, I got, my, I got divorced the first time. I thought it was her because, you know, like you say, we're making good money. She wanted all these nice things, and I'm going, it doesn't last forever. You got to. Yeah. 
you know, she wants this, she wants that. And I'm all, mm-hmm. you know, I gave her everything. And I started thinking, we got to save money because it's not going to last forever. Mm-hmm. And she goes, well, you know, your parents have money, so I got to get stuff for my mom and dad. And then I'm all, I said, oh, all my money's gone. I was like, what the? I worked yeah. all these years, and now yeah. I had a nice set nest egg, and now it's like, so no, I'm done. Mm-hmm. We got we got divorced. And then when I divorced her, I met my second ex-wife, Terry. Terry. Mm-hmm. She was Miss Missouri at the time, Terry Bollinger. Okay. Uh, we met, and then we started dating. Four years later, we got married. Mm-hmm. And then we had my daughter, because uh, I had a son of my first wife, Cody, he's 24 and married, goes to college at BYU of Idaho and Rexburg. Hmm. Then my oldest, my then my second ex-wife, Terry, uh, she and I had a daughter, Lexi, who's 18 and goes to College of the Ozarks. Okay. She goes nice. into music. She loves to sing. Nice. And she plays the flute. Oh. And then my youngest son, my last child, he's 14. He's, he's a swimmer. And plays the sax, and he goes, he's a freshman in high school. Okay. Hmm. And none of them, my oldest son tried football one year, but that's it. Yeah, none of them, my youngest two swim, and they do band stuff because that's what their mom did. Mm-hmm. Uh, my oldest son didn't play really any sports. He played baseball a little bit growing up. He didn't do anything in high school. Uh, he played volleyball his sophomore and junior year, didn't play his senior year. Hmm. Uh, my daughter ran track at the high school. She hundred and she did hundred and four by one relay, and then she also did a quarter. She did with it the four hundred. Yeah, she did the four hundred. Uh, and yeah, that's about it. Okay. Then got divorced again. I was about fifty five years ago. I was like fifteen and a half. Now these guys are talking about half birthdays earlier with your kids. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, so I was 15 and a half. 15 and a half. Got divorced and living by myself in probably the darkest time of my life because I went from all this fun, fun stuff that we had. I was yeah. talking about playing football. I had a wife. I had kids. Um, I run my camps. So I, I coach pro football, trying to get back into pro football. Uh, had a beautiful wife. Um, she was Miss Missouri. Um, professional athlete, you know, married the, I got to marry the pretty gal. Um, she was a flight nurse. She's still a flight nurse. She's great at what she does. Um, we just, I was trying to find what I wanted to do, trying to find a job. She needs something more secure. And I couldn't give that to her cause I was, Mm. didn't know what the hell I wanted to do. Yeah. I was 50 years old and this is what you're supposed to do at 20 coming out of college. Don't yeah. know what to do. You kind of lost your identity. Huh? Yes. I lost everything. Yeah. You know, I did, I wasn't coaching. I wasn't doing any coaching. I wasn't coaching high school. I wasn't coaching the NFL. I wasn't doing my king camps. Um, I was injured. I was going, uh, well, I wasn't injured yet. I started working for tiger, but then a year, a year and a half later, I got injured. So I'm at my house doing nothing. Yeah. By myself. By and that's right around 2020. You said you had the surgery, right? Yeah. So then you that got the whole surgery. pandemic so situation. 20, 2019 was my first back surgery. May, okay. May, May 18th, May 18th of 19, I had my first back surgery. Okay. And then May, October 5th I had the, of 2020, I had the second one. You know, I was dating some gals at the time, but when they left, you know, I was by my home by myself, you know, mm-hmm. for weeks on end, and it's just it was not good. I, I struggled. I've struggled. Went to. I went through depression, big time. Um, a friend of mine who's a doctor. Uh, called me. He goes, "Hey, you haven't had a uh, checkup in a long time." I said, "Yeah, I know. I, I'm good." He goes, "No." He goes, you got to come see me. I'm okay. I went there for the checkup. You know, you know, I was going through my back surgeries, and he knew I lived at home by myself. And uh, he was out. He asked me how I was doing. Doc, Doc did. I said not good. And I go, I can. I have known Doc for. He was a team doctor when I first started coaching high school in 2002. So I've known him for 20 years. Mm-hmm. And I said, I'm 
really depressed. He goes, well, what do you mean you're depressed? He goes, thought about suicide and all. Yep. I had the gun out. Mm. I couldn't do it because, I mean, I sat there for a couple hours. I couldn't do it because I couldn't use my, I couldn't use my dad's gun. Oh. Like the gun I was telling you earlier, the 45 that I have. Yep. And I had it out because I figured if I'm going to do it, I'm not going to use the, I have a, I also have a little nine millimeter. I'm all, I want to do it. I don't want to yeah. have my face reconstructed. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. Just do it one time. And then I, um, had to call, I, that's when I, I called Doc, and, uh, you know, I talked to him, and then that's when he told me, I, that's that's the day he told me, he goes, you got to come in and do a, he goes, you got to come in and uh, have a. Uh, just to come see him. Yeah, just to yeah. come see him. Yeah. And I, Did they put you on any antidepressants yeah, yeah, or so anything I'm, at that time? I'm, I'm still on them. Yeah. That, you know, that was. That was 20, that was December of 19. Okay. Because it was six months after my first one. Hmm. After my first back surgery. I mean, I was Christmas time. Yeah. What really got me was Christmas time. My kids were with their mom. I was by myself. And I was just like, it was around Christmas. I was just like, yeah, I don't have nothing. Yeah. I'm, I went from a, an acre lot house. You know, I had a house like this. Mm -hmm. um, and I went from that to having a little 1,200 square foot home. And my dinner table was plastic patio furniture. So I had nothing. And yeah, I w I'm glad I went and saw him. And I. But do you still struggle today or are you doing better? I mean, you're doing better. Obviously, I, you're doing better, but do you still I, have struggles? I still have struggles on, you know, different days. I mean, I luckily, I take my uh, me, uh, my my Mexican, <laughs> my medicine. <laughs> that was about to be a joke there. Yeah. <laughs> I take my medicine. Uh, it's, uh, it's a 60 milligram capsule. It starts with a D. And I wish it was. Dilaudid. I'm terrible at knowing those names. I wish it was Dilaudid, but Dilaudid is not. That's a pain medicine I had okay. when I had pancreatitis. Um, oh yeah, I had pancreatitis too. Yeah. <laughs> oh gosh. And next week on the show, part two. Of the As the world turns. Yeah. We'll right. 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 <laughs> um, so you're still on the medication, yeah. and and it's helping. Yes. Okay. I, and thank God I have. You know, I. Get, you know, now that COVID, you know, COVID's over because this yeah. was a lot of it during COVID. Yeah, mm. right before it. So, yeah, yeah, all started this right before. This is when I had it. And now, I, you know, mm -hmm. my good friend Kelly Goodburn, I come out and help him. Mm -hmm. um, I refinished his basement for him. I, nice. I uh, pulled up the carpet. I pulled up the patty and I took a bookcase down that was nailed on the wall. Took that down, mudded it, sanded it. Um, lay down two by two, uh, subfloor. I did that, made sure there was squares. So when I laid the tile, we had, uh, six inch by 24 <laughs> inch tile that I laid in his basement. I, uh, mudded, uh, uh, yeah, mud, put the glue down. I did the tile. Jill's I, getting like getting an idea here. I, I, don't know. I, mm -hmm. I, I grouted it. I mm -hmm. did his basement. I put the crown molding back up. I ran, uh, uh, cable, I ran a uh, wire from the basement because it's uh, Louis. You did everything. Yes, <laughs> I ran power. I hung a TV form. Yeah, uh, I sanded the wall so his wife could paint it. Yeah, I put my because there's holes in the wall, so I mudded it. And some spots I had to use tape, mud and tape. Mm -hmm. So since then, I you know I'm on injured reserve. I'm on workers' comp, but I'm able to go out and help and do things like this for people. Yeah. So you um, did his honey do list, basically. Yes, because he's not handy at all. Okay. His well, my wife, husband's really handy, but we have a really long list. So I, I'm just like you were talking, and I like, was like, huh. I mean, so, I bet I could keep Louie busy. Well, teamwork yeah. here. Yeah. yeah. Teamwork so doing stuff like that, 
Has that helped you? It's helped me out tremendously. That's so good. The last, because I was 19, now we're in 22, so that was two and a half years ago. Yeah. yeah. Or two, oh well, yeah. Because we're going to be, yeah, it's going to be two years ago, 19, 20, 21, yeah, three years ago, because it was December. Um, so I started trying to get out more, because I was just sitting at home doing nothing. Yeah. Um. That makes sense, though, because if you if you think back, I don't know how long in the podcast, but if matter. you've been watching the video, but when, but when you were talking about doing the plumbing work and you go, I love getting up there and then you do it and you make it and it looks right. And you're like, it, yeah, I did that. And you like lit up, you know, like yeah. it's not football. Right. Right. It's not football. It's right. not the, the thing you you work so hard to 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 perfect. Because I, I know that's done. For, it's taken me a long time. to get. I know that I'm done with that. Right. Yeah. I know. But for you to find something like plumbing, not everybody can do that. I, yeah. That see, he lit up I, again. I, right? I love, I love that work on my hands. Yeah, yeah. Kelly Goodburn's son, he, uh, Kyle. I talk a lot about Kelly Goodburn. Yeah, you he's do. He's a great friend of mine. Yeah. yeah, he helped me punt. I stay at their house. Their yeah. sons. I, um, his son goes, "Well, my, can you check my brakes?" Okay. Yeah. So I jacked the car up. I said, "You need new brakes." That's awesome. And I take it. I I took the brakes apart. Yeah. I showed it to him. I went up and bought new ones. Put them on for him. I did his front brakes. Took me less than an hour to do front brakes. Mm-hmm. You know, take them off, put new ones on, clean everything with brake cleaner, and put them <laughs> back on and <laughs> tighten it up. You know, tighten up with the uh, seven millimeter hex <laughs> See, that I need so in. Specific, I love <laughs> it. You know, I yeah. had the hex. You know, I, I bought the ones that go onto my drill, so I don't have to go. You yeah. know, use my hand. Yeah, my yep, hands. Yep. So right. uh, uh, <laughs> out there like tool. I'm like NASCAR. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm out there doing that and put the brake, redo his front brakes. And by that time, it was, you know, got late, got like nine o'clock. I said, okay, I'll check your brakes tomorrow, the rear brakes. I showed him how to, you know, take the uh, jack car up, put the jack mm-hmm. underneath it, take the tire off. We took the drum. It was it's, uh, his car, even though it's a 12, he saw his drum brakes in the back okay. instead of disc brakes. Okay. So I said, he goes, you want me to put the emergency brake on? I said, you can't. He's a why? I go, because if you put the emergency brake on, as you push it down, it pulls the cable, and then the brakes in the back and the inside the drum are going to expand. I'm not going to be able to take the drum off, so you got to leave that off. I go, we got to put a 2 by 4 under all three wheels so it won't roll on me. Mm-hmm. So we did that. I took the drum off and showed him his rear brakes, and I said, they're still good. You can still see the writing on them. Because okay, put that back on, and then <laughs> I fixed his EGR it. valve that was stuck, and I took that off, and I had to take that off. It was on the, uh, on the back side of the motor. Took that off, sprayed cleaner in it, cleaned it out, put it back on. His car, his, he goes, oh, it's been a month. He goes, oh, my my uh, EGR valve, the engine light doesn't come on anymore. Mm-hmm. Thanks for fixing it. <laughs> so I, I love being hands. I I found something, you know, I did construction. I do the plumbing. I love doing that work because when you, you know, when you sit here and look at this, you can be proud of what you yeah. did. You said you helped out down here. Yeah. I do stuff for my house. I do my stuff for my friends. Yeah. When I'm done, I go, I can only work two, maybe three hours at a time. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And with my back. I mean, after, after 45 minutes, it starts hurting yeah. my back from bending over. Yeah. But, it's going to hurt the rest of my life. Yeah. And so I know that it's just, I don't take pain pills. I will not take Oxy. They give me all that. Mm-hmm. Um, um, That's just I'm going a, down I'm another a, slippery slope. Yeah. I've seen too many of my friends mm-hmm. get um, hooked on them. Yeah. So, you know, the only thing I do take really is my uh, sins of benzaprine. It's a muscle relaxer. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so it makes me sleep at night. Yeah. But it, if I have something big to do the next day, I can't take it because I'll sleep 10, 12, 14 hours with it. Right. <laughs> um, so I want to get towards the end here, but I wanted to ask this as revisiting the, de- the depression, because again, this being a humanity podcast, me telling my story, I was blown away by the amount of people who reached out to me that told me that they were grateful for me telling my story because that didn't, it helped them not feel alone. Um, And so I guess where I'm ultimately going with this is, you know, for me, the struggle of um, being open about my shame of going through depression, why should I be depressed, right? Got a family, got a beautiful house, got all these things. Why should I be depressed? 
and I was internalizing all that and it was killing me to where it was physically affecting my body. I talk about that in the very first episode. If you get a chance, give it a listen. Mm -hmm. Um, so what was it that helped you recognize your depression? I mean, was it simply just going to the doctor and saying, I've got these emotions, I need to get on some medication. And then after the medication, you were good. And you started doing these little handy job, handy uh, man jobs that helped pull you out. But was there anything more the rooted? Gun, the gun that was next to my temple, the 45. Yeah. And I knew if I pulled it, that... It was a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Yes. And I didn't want to be a coward to not be able to raise my, help raise my three kids. Yeah. And it took me, I've never, Doc Lattimore is the only one I've talked to about this. And I knew at that point when I had the gun there that I really, truly needed help. Yeah. Because I've, you know, I went from being a professional athlete, Uh being married to a gorgeous lady, Uh divorced, back surgery, on my own. It's like you I can't. Where to turn? I mean, I <clears> yeah, no, you're feeling like you can't win for trying. I have no family out here. My mom and dad, my three older brothers, all live in California. Yeah. I have a son who lives in Idaho who's married. Yeah. And my kids, two years ago, was twelve and sixteen. I'm not going to call them. So I had no one to talk to out there. And until now, you've not talked to anybody but your doctor. Now, obviously, you have a relationship with your doctor, right? Yeah, it's and some, like, I, you know, I have a great relationship. So he's like a friend. He's just, yes. it helps that he's also a medical doctor. Correct. And I've started, you know, he made me check in with him. Good. Every day, you know, text him, make sure that I was, you know, how, how you doing? And yeah. he got me into rotary. Oh. So I do rotary now. We meet every Tuesday. So we do that and we raise money for kids. Back in, uh, wa- uh, that was in Waterloo, Illinois. So help me, he helped me get out of my house mm-hmm. and show me that even though I'm not a professional athlete anymore, I'm not, I wasn't coaching at the time, that I can still get out and do good things. I figured, okay, mm-hmm. I was a professional athlete. I'm coaching. I'm married. I needed Yes, I didn't think I mattered anymore. I was by myself. And when you showed me that, i that's true. I didn't think I did. I know, I didn't either. And him getting me out to Rotary Club, you know, once a week and checking in with him and taking my antidepressant pill, he's helped me get out of, out of where I was at. Good. But do I still think about it when I'm home alone by myself? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, I still think about it. But I know that now when you show me the sign, I, if I did do that, I'm letting down mm-hmm. my coach high school football mm-hmm. again. I'll be letting down 100 kids. Mm-hmm. Or your kids. Or my kids. Your kids, and they're going to have kids, yeah. and then your grandkids. I'm be letting and, everybody yeah. down. And I, that's what kept me alive, Louie. It's okay. really the reason that I I had suicidal ideation and the thing that kept me alive, really, I truly believe this, was I didn't have the balls to do it because I knew how much it would screw up my kids. I've never even told my mom or dad this. I was going to ask you about family. Like you said, you haven't talked to anybody about your doctor friend, but your parents, your ex-wife, I, I, your kids. I haven't talked to anybody. I, no. Is that is that part, I'm going to ask this because I know what it was for me. Was it you not talking about it because of the stigma shamed. and the shame? Of I was shamed. Shamed. Me too. Me too. I felt enormous shame a, that I couldn't pick fine. myself up, you know, because as men, you're a little bit older than I am, but in, in our era growing up, we're taught as men that you don't share your emotion. <laughs> I was going to say, guys, we're like, geez, I, we're still, I'm trying to say we're from the same era. We're well, still from the same era. I got you by nine years. Yeah. So... <laughs> 
<laughs> but we're taught as men at that age, you know, you don't show your emotion. You pick no. yourself up, you brush yourself off, you get back into the game. Rub some you know, dirt on it. Rub some Let's dirt go. on it. Absolutely. Yeah, that's and what my so, mom still does. My mom says that. And the only... Well, go ahead. I'll let you finish. No, no, no. I was just going to say that you were experiencing some of the same emotions that I was feeling. And I didn't feel like after the success that I had had, and now the feeling like I can't win for trying, I've got these failures that are happening one after another. If I open up uh, about this and share it, then I'm, you know, there, I'm, I'm going to be looked at as a fake or a phony or a failure and I, you know, or, or a sissy because I'm sharing my emotions and like, Oh, well, this guy just needs a handout. He's just wants somebody to feel sorry for him. You know, no, I don't want any of that. I just, I didn't know what to do with all of these confusing no emotions idea. that I had. I had no idea. Yeah. Hmm. Um, but you know, like, but here's what I want to tell you, man. And I think you know this, well, and I know this now is that you do matter and you would be surprised by opening up how many people will want to be there to lift you up. Well, after I've been divorced twice, when I'm going to have a gal, this happened last, not this is 20, 20, 20, 20 it's 2022, 2021. I was dating a gal mm -hmm. and I did not tell my parents that she was going to come out to Lake Tahoe. She's, you know, got her flight to come on out. My mom and dad are still old school. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I told my mom that Tracy was coming out to, you know, spend a few days with us, my mom goes, you know, I can't sleep in the same room as her. I said, I understand that, Mom. I go, I will not do that underneath your roof. I go, we're not married. She goes, yeah, you're not. My parents are still like that, too. And then she goes, you know something? If you weren't divorced twice, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be the disgrace of this family. Mm. And when she said that, <clears throat> I walked to the door. I slammed it. Got my car and took off. I went packed. I went got my clothes, packed my car, and I left. And my dad, I love my dad to death. I do it. I, I'm gonna when my dad passed away. It's gonna hurt. My mm -hmm. mom, not so much. Mm -hmm. I love my mom, but my dad called and called and called, and I went to my buddy's house in Reno, Nevada. And he goes, I call him. I said, I got to say that I'm staying with you the rest of the week. He's all, why? I go, my mom just flat out told me I'm mm -hmm. the disgrace of the family because I've been married, divorced twice, and she, he won't, she doesn't want Tracy up here. So that's another part that. You so know, you said that your dad's calling you over and over again? Yeah, and I won't yeah. answer the phone because I was just too pissed off of what his Have wife. Have you talked to mother, either one of them since? Yeah. Because it's been a year, right? Yeah, I've, I, I, I talked to my dad that. I talked to my dad the next day. About that. And he goes, your mother, that mean that I suggest dad. I'm, she did mean it. Um, and so when I've already thought about suicide once a couple of years before, when I was driving down that hill mm -hmm. from Tahoe on, I, on Highway 50, if my phone didn't ring, I, mm. I saw him call me, and I knew that he wanted me around, but I would not answer. Cause I, I, that that was the second second mm -hmm. time I thought about. Mm -hmm. When your when your mother tells you you're the, you're the disgrace of the family, so I'm driving down fifty. I, I about drove off. There's I knew I go. Mm -hmm. There's this opening. If I go fast enough, yeah, I can go right through the guardrail and take off. And I. But if my dad didn't call me, I probably would have done it. So that was twice. I I'm glad he called it. you, bud. Uh, it's been twice. I've it's been twice, and when you know, it was bad enough. I was a year and a half earlier, because that was 19. Now this is 21. Year and a half later, because it wasn't in December. It was in July. I was on my meds, and then my mom tells me that. Mm. That yeah. was yeah. If my dad would not have called me. I would have, I was going, I knew it was halfway down the mountain. There's an opening right there, right? I can still see it, that I was going to take the rental car and go. So, but I didn't because I knew my dad was calling me and I had to talk to him. Yeah. 
So, I mean, most people think about it a couple of times, and I have, and I'm all, I look like I was on my meds a second time because I probably would have if I didn't. Yeah. So are you in any kind of counseling at all, or, or no, have you been? No? Because I'm ashamed. Yeah. Hmm. Man, what, I'm, what I'm, gets me going? I don't know. You might have been through counseling. Nope. Um, you haven't. Nope. And what has helped me out is working. One hundred percent. When I'm work, because when my mom always says how hard my brother Steve, my, he's number three, how hard he works. Like yeah. he, he works construction. Mm -hmm. Oh, he he comes here. He's he's sore every night. He's hurt. He, you know, he's had two plastic knees. Two plastic knees redone. He works hard. Well, your oldest son, who top he for 35 years, doesn't work hard. Mm -hmm. The other brother, my other brother doesn't work hard. I don't work hard, but you always say how hard Steve works. Yeah. So why? Because it's, you see the work that he's doing? And she always talks, oh, Steve always works so hard. Steve works so hard. Steve, well, so do I, so do I, Mom. Oh, no, you don't. And she tells me on the disgrace of the family, it was, it was hard to take. Oh, I can't, I, I can't even fathom. Like, I am certainly I mean, not. She's so old school that. Yeah. I hear stories like this from other people and I can't process and, and I certainly don't know what to tell those people. I am not um, educated or qualified to give the answer. Here's what I feel like I am qualified to say because I've experienced it is, is that when you are at your darkest moment, like you and I both were, and you're thinking the, the darkest thing, like ending it all. Um, I have learned from my experiences that, you have to talk about it. You have to open up. You have to talk about it because it will destroy you inside. It will physically affect your body. And I have learned in the process of challenging myself to be more open as hard as it is. And I'm, I'm struggling with it right now. I'm actually cringing inside openly saying and looking into a camera. Yes. I thought about committing suicide. Yes. Ronnie Phillips, the guy who's got a TV show. He was on radio for 22 years, has got married and kids and has all of these things and no reason to have, the thoughts of ending it, I was there and I couldn't get out of my own way. And it was, and so by doing this podcast and talking to others, I've learned that they're, oh my gosh, not only do people love me, you know, like people really love me, even when, when I couldn't even love myself, yeah. I wasn't capable of loving myself. But man, when I was talking about it, people not just doing, cause I was just, they're scared. They're you know, Ronnie's going to kill himself. They're genuinely loving me and lifting me up. Right. And that's what you, man, I can tell in the short time, well, two hours and 51 minutes that we've been doing this podcast, you've got a heart of gold, Louie. You've got a heart that would lift anybody up. And if anybody, like, I think if I came to you right now and said, man, I need some help, you would be that person that would do I'll that for me. We are generally, most people by nature would do that for other people. Right. We should give them the credit to, to allow them to do it. Right. I didn't, I was a fear that if I talk like this and I talk and I, and I was bringing out all this negativity of all these things that I was bringing that I was those people, I was going to bring those people down, you know, because they, you're a product of your environment. Right. And if I, if I open up about this, someone's, I'm going to bring those, I can't bring those people down. I wasn't giving those people enough credit. Don't give, or rather, let me back up. Give those people who you love that are in your circle enough credit that they love you and they want to help you. Right. Let them help you. And when Julian asked me to do this, I told her, you know, hell yeah. I mean, I I even told her in the text, I've never ever talked about anything like this. Yeah. Because you don't talk about this. You don't typically. Yeah. Right. No. Well, I, th I think, and I mean, I'm just sitting here and I, I can't relate. It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart for Ronnie. It breaks my heart mm -hmm. for you. But I, you know, Ronnie's figured out, I think, and I'm not going to try to get too personal with the other one of you, but like, I just, I just, I would want to encourage you, whatever you need to do, whether it's talking about it or, or maybe it's counseling, maybe it's not, maybe it's just talking to your doctor. Maybe that's enough, but like, it's, it like worries me for you that, you know, it wasn't the one time. It was the next time. And so, so what happens when it's the next time, you know, like, right. like if, if you get to where, and I'm not trying to be negative Nelly over here, but mm -hmm. if you get to where you can't do the little projects that are bringing you that joy and helping friends out and it's, and your mom says something else or it's somebody else that says something else or, you know what I mean? Like, right. like I just hope that that doctor friend or, or whoever 
I check in with him quite a bit. Has has the ability to help you pull and, out of that yeah. situation. And since, I mean, I've been, I I look forward to like I just last week I fixed some railing on a house for a realtor. Yeah. And then I had to power wash three houses. Mm. I'm fit. I'm going. I went the week before. I'm at Brian Jordan's. Brian Jordan's golf tournament, hanging out with Charles Barkley and Chris <laughs> Tucker. <laughs> well, I'm playing golf, hanging out with a celebrity. Right. Next day, I'm here power washing right. three houses. I, yeah. I love my job. Yeah, that's cool. I love what I do. I said, yeah. I went from a being, a, again, a professional athlete. Yeah. And now I'm mm-hmm. just a normal person power washing houses. Yeah. Power washing is pretty satisfying, though, if you think oh, about it. I, I right? have so much Just fun. that you see that line, yep. and you go back. Oh, you yeah. can write words on the side of the wall, <laughs> and then you can clean them off. So, yeah, Louis never peed his name in the snow. I can tell already. Uh. <laughs> Louis, you know, I, I can write my name on the side of the wall. I'm all, damn, man, that looks pretty cool. And I got to clean it off. All right. <laughs> moving on. Moving but, on. You know, just oh. power washing, doing stuff. I, yeah, I just. You find the satisfaction I, in that. I, as soon as I, <clears> as long as I, and that, you know, even in my, you know, when I start feeling like, oh man, I got to do, you know, I start feeling down a little bit. I'm like, oh, I got stuff here at my house to do. Mm-hmm. I yeah. got to do laundry. Yeah. Well, oh, she me when I vacuum. I got to make sure they're straight lines. <laughs> right. Right. I'm all, oh my, you know, I'm all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Hey. I guess this has to look perfect. Mm-hmm. Listen. You know, and I got to walk into the kitchen because I can't have any footprints. And when I get mm. done, my dog walks right over. Right. And you're like, ah, yeah. oh, you. Well, thanks, Ch- Chica. I'm, I just want to say this. Like, I'm glad that you are finding medicine in your work. Yeah. And in the satisfaction in that stuff. But yeah. if I could be a friend. Um, who's kind of gone through this, I will tell you this, that love conquers all. I love that. conquers all, but you have to allow people to love you. Right. And yeah. you are worthy and you matter of love. You you are worthy of it. And I wasn't I wasn't feeling that. I felt like, man, why why would anybody want to love me? I, I can't even get out of my own way. Right. Bro, just talk about it. You have to, if you internalize it, it will destroy you. And I'm so freaking proud of you. Because not only did you go get help from your doctor and get the medicine that will give you the clarity to kind of find your way to take the next steps to pro- to progress, but to come on here and do this, even though we've got, I mean, a few hundred listeners, I mean, I think our, our best podcast has gotten six over 600 new listeners, right? So that, that's awesome for a new podcast, episode 21. Right. For you to still come on to a show like this and to tell your story and be as raw and authentic as you were takes incredible courage. And I know from firsthand how difficult it is. I still cringe when I talk about my story. So um, you will you will be surprised how many people that hear this, I think, um, that will reach out to you and say thank you for telling your story because it helped them feel like they weren't alone. It, You're helping people telling your story. I, I promise I, you. I enjoy... She knows that I try to be the life of the party. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I can kind of relate to that. And now I, you know, before I used, you know, when I was, you know, before I had pancreatitis, this mm-hmm. is five years ago. Um, I had, I had pancreatitis and I always, you know, I like to have my, you know, I like to drink and have mm-hmm. my, uh, my vodka. <laughs> you like to have a good time. Yeah, I th- you know, I try to, I'd always drink and try to be a life of the party. But now, mm-hmm. I have pancreatitis, I'm not allowed to drink. And I can mm-hmm. still be me and have so much fun. Yeah. yeah. But I think that if I would have been drinking at those times, mm. I think for sure it I would have been a different felt, result. Yeah, I think for sure I would have been, I would not be here. But not drinking, I think. You know, because of my pancreatitis, I think that's also helped me mm. go a little bit straighter. Yeah. And so, I, I mean, I don't drink. I don't, my, my drink now is Diet Coke. I know that's not good. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go and Dirty Duck Coffee. Yeah, I'll, I'll do uh, two liters a day of that. But, yeah, and uh, with, thank goodness for my doctor, Dr. Lattimore. I, he's, 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 I call my brother and I told him he saved, yeah. he saved my life. And he's. If I have any problems, I always get a hold of him. That's good. And he always makes sure I always have his uh, Sean, uh, Doctor Sean, where I always 
Anytime you have sausage, I always like to get his meat in my mouth. <laughs> okay, wait a second. I missed something there. He has deer sausage. Deer sausage. Yes, okay. I like his deer sausage. I like to have his meat in my mouth. Uh-huh. Deer mm. sausage. Yeah. And his wife always says, here, have some more of uh, my husband's meat in your mouth. <laughs> See? <laughs> See, now I have stuff like that, and I can have fun. And yeah. Right. It Life takes, of the party. Yes. yes no takes, vodka. No vodka. And I can. Right. This helps. Since I've gone through that and since I've gone through this, my last episode, I don't care what people think anymore. Boom. I, That's I, it. That is it. I right. hundred percent right there. I have so much fun now. I say and do what I want. People look at me and yep. they go, I go, I don't care. I go, I should have died twice. I've had cancer. I've pan- had pancreatitis. Mm-hmm. I've never said anything about the depression. I just, mm-hmm. I, I, there's a couple other times I should have been dead. I go, right. I don't care anymore. I'm going to, in the last year and a half, two and a half years, I don't care anymore. I'm going to on it. Say what I want. Care about yourself and just yeah. don't care about what other people right. think. Yeah. And I, and I say what I want. I enjoy my life and I try to help people to understand yes. that what, when I'm happy, there's nothing wrong with me. Yeah. And that's how it's been since two, you know, a year and a half ago. I, yeah. I have so much more fun now. Good. I don't, you know, I, with when ha- talking to doc, I, it's been. So, but that would be your biggest, like myself, I like to try to come full circle with this. Somebody, somebody is going to be listening to this, mm-hmm. watching this, and, and going through this, and not know how to get out of their own way. And right. I think you and I are both echoing the same sentiment that you've got to talk about it. I had to talk to, and I, I've talked to Sean uh, about it. I've not talked to my mom and dad. I've not talked to my brothers. Um, I mentioned it to uh, Jillian here, and now, hopefully, the two people that watch this. <laughs> <laughs> tell two people and someone yeah and someone. so if we can double it every day well, yeah 30 days we'll have five million people watching this right so please double it out give it double it out and give it to somebody that needs help because right. if two friends send it out to two mm-hmm. people every day yeah by the end of the month we're gonna have about four million people watching this it's like so a chain it's this. like those old chain letters yes right, right. <laughs> Where you, like, never thought about that letters. yes no but it that it's just true that, i need i needed help and i didn't like i said i didn't know how to get out of my own way until mm-hmm. i had the i had the gun up i had it there and i'm all i just I, think i can't be a coward i think it's <clears throat> i'm gonna get a little i don't spiritual but i just think it, this is another example of how god does things yeah, i go to in, church and all that right. and I do the right things and no 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 I'm not well, I was in passing John I was just saying I feel blessed to not only have Louis Aguiar the former chief punter of the Kansas City Chiefs in my house but now I feel like I've got a brother who is somebody who's experienced something deep and dark and emotional much like I did and I want you to know you're going to get my number before we leave and I'll you, give you mine right now eight six seven five three zero nine I love that song <laughs> and you reach out to me anytime. You reach out to me it's, anytime. And so I try, you know, I say, joke, you know, my kids get mad at me. Well, dad, that's a dad joke. I'm all, well, that's for me right now. That's who we are, man. That's, I have started that the last couple of years since all this has happened. And that's what makes me happy. Yeah. I might say dad jokes over and over. Hey, you know why they have a fence around the cemetery? Because people are dying to get in there. And every time, <laughs> and every time we go by a cemetery, oh my, my kids God. go, dad, don't say it. I'm all, well, I have to. Right. That's what just makes me happy. Yeah. yeah. I just. I know they're dad stupid old jokes, but yeah, as long as I'm you do you do I'm, you long Lou. as I'm having long as I'm having fun and I don't think about the the dark side of me. That's I gotta have fun and that's, that's just, it. When I, I was playing, I was having fun. Yeah, mm-hmm. I look back to yes, I've lost so much. I've used to be a professional athlete. I was married to Miss Missouri. Mm-hmm. I had a kid. I had a one wife. Okay, I had another wife and. I was married to Miss Missouri. I had kids, and mm-hmm. now it got taken away, mm-hmm. and not on my terms. Yeah. You know, she and I were going to, you know, because I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was trying to find a job, and I didn't. I was 50 years old and didn't have a career. And so it was like, and she knew what she wanted. She was a nurse. She wanted mm-hmm. to do this. And she want to go this way, and I'm still going this way because I don't know what I want to do and find a job, and yeah, and so it just it wore on her. Mm-hmm. I still love her to death. 
Sure. It's I, the mother of your kids. My first wife. Mm-hmm. Eh. <laughs> just just the one kid. Yeah, okay. yeah. But the second one, Terry, yes. Yeah. God's got a plan I'm for so, you I'm too, so man. I'm so in love. I'm, I compare every, anybody, I date anybody, I compare them to her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm so in love with her. But I know she's dating, she married somebody already. They're happy, and I just want her to be happy. As long as she's happy, I'm happy. That's well, all I care about. Like Ronnie said, God's got a plan, and it, and it's and it's the and it's obviously everything. It's the whole big circle. It's not just just you. It's not just Ronnie. It's not mm-hmm. just me. But just to like sixty second recap of how this even happened, I posted a picture on I think my story last week of maybe my son, like an old football picture of my son like when he was little little like playing youth football yeah and i just happened to click on my story you know like if you see your story back and you see who liked it and mm-hmm. one of the, the most recent likes was louis oh cool okay now I, i'd never noticed if you'd ever liked a picture ever before uh-huh. I, I couldn't i wouldn't know okay but that went huh that's interesting and at the time the picture my son was wearing number five and i was like oh that's kind of funny you oh, know yeah. just kind of whatever maybe maybe that's why he liked it he saw a kid yeah with a number five and it you know, I just so, remember you and all that. I just no, yeah, yeah, but so so then I go, oh man, maybe he would probably be great for the podcast because he's funny. Yeah, and like I don't know all this stuff. I don't know that you've struggled, right? Even right. though that's what Ronnie's doing with the podcast, like that right. was the whole purpose of the podcast. But I just tell Ronnie, like, this is where my punter kicker stupidity came mm-hmm. into play. I go, mm-hmm. Butker's back. What about Louis Aguiar? And he's like, great. And I go, okay, I'll I'll try to get a hold of him. And then I want to explain to you what kind of podcast you're coming on, right? Mm-hmm. And I say it's humanity podcast. He started it because he was struggling. Da 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 da. Had no idea you struggled. And then you comment back and say, "Yeah, I definitely had some struggles, and I've never talked about it. But this is the place to do it. This, I guess, mm-hmm. now's the time. I mean, just isn't that crazy? Like little, well, little, little just, this, little that, little this. From liking a picture of hers to knowing that what you've gone through, and you said, "Oh yeah, get him on." And she didn't know I have had these struggles, right. and I told her that on yeah, on, yeah. Um, uh, messenger and then on text yeah. I said here here's my phone number text me mm-hmm. right. so I gave her my phone number two seconds later I got a text and I said oh yeah I've yeah and that's all just it's power not, of God it's not crazy it's not coincidence it's God it's just it's God went thing. from liking a picture to yeah. being here talking about mm-hmm. it all because of yeah her and I've known mm-hmm. her I've known you for how long now oh man <laughs> 20, 20, uh, it'd be closer 25? to 25 years. Yeah. 25 years. Yeah. 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 I yeah. am so honored that you, you took the time to come you, and do this. You used to do afternoons on Q104. Middays. I yeah. started doing nights and then I went to middays. I remember all that. Yeah. yeah. I remember you were, you were talking about, you know, doing that. I always, I was always on Randy at seven, you know, and then after, even when I got done playing, Every time I'd come back here, you're still on Q104. I used to listen to you in the afternoons. Yeah. Mid afternoon. I don't, you know. Whatever. Mid afternoon. Yeah. 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 Till three. Yeah. Yeah. Because now we're sitting there talking about him all. I know that voice. <laughs> I didn't want to say anything. How, how long did it take? The, how many didn't hours know the name, did it take? I knew the voice. Three hours of the actual recording of the podcast and the hour that we spent Visited, together yeah. before we started yeah. the podcast. Well, we're going to go ahead and wrap yeah. this up. Louie, I really appreciate this, dude. This has been an incredible conversation. I think uh, you've had some great stories about your days playing with the Chiefs and what you've done with your career. I think that your story is going to help a lot of people, and I couldn't have been more honored to have you in my home to tell to be a part of this so thank you so much i really appreciate it and this is the song i used to listen to before every game <laughs> is, is it girls 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 i listened to it before a game when For i played yeah. it. <laughs> how, oh how, how, how uh, we gotta play that? it again because the bed ran out yeah. all right so for jillian greg and uh, i want to again send a big thanks to dakota and quentin of marathon media management for inspiring me to do this show and of course um Rick Hunter and Rich Donovan for helping produce the production elements. That is episode 21 of the Papa Ron podcast with our good friend, Louis Aguiar. You've been listening to the Papa Ron podcast. M-H-D. If you enjoyed this show, hit subscribe now and tell your friends on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, and other social platforms. To participate on the show, leave a message with your comments or questions by calling or texting. 816-558-6389. That's 816-558-6389. Until next time, thanks for listening to the Papa Ron Podcast. Papa Ron Podcast.